Okay, I call this meeting of the Oversight Committee to order. It is now at Central Time, 10.07. Due to continued COVID-19 precautions and Governor Abbott's suspension of certain open meeting acts re act requirements, we are holding this meeting by video conference via GoToWebinar. I want to thank the staff, fellow members, presenters, and members of the public for their flexibility and understanding during this unique time. Before we start the agenda, I want to go over some important points for this meeting. If you are not speaking, please make sure that your microphone is on mute. We will try to avoid speaking over our fellow members when asking questions or providing comments on agenda items. If you do have a question or comment, members, please raise your hand and I will recognize you to speak. Ms. Ms. Doyle will assist me in monitoring which members would like to speak when several of you are raising your hand. Please leave your cameras on for the entire meeting. This is the easiest way to see that we are maintaining a quorum of members. In the unlikely event that our video conference technology fails completely, we have published a call-in number on the meeting notice that we will switch to for continuing the public meeting by teleconference. CFRT has included a copy of the meeting notice the in, with the call-in number at the beginning of the agenda packet. Finally, if an oversight committee member disconnects from the meeting and cannot reconnect, please contact Michael Fisher so that they can help you, so he can help you to rejoin the meeting. Okay, let's move on to roll call. I know that I just asked you to mute yourselves, but for the roll call, make sure that your microphone is on. Dr. Cummings, would you please proceed? Certainly, good morning, everyone. We will take roll through the members uh, one by one and alphabetically. I will count myself present. Dr. Hernandez? Present. Mr. Margo? Present. Mr. Montgomery? Present. And Dr. attending. Patel. And Dr. Patel? Present. Dr. Rice? He's trying to call in now. Um, okay. I'm trying to send him that uh, the, the 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 number, the bridge number. I hope that one connects him through. And Dr. Rosenfeld. Present. Therefore, we have six voting members online right now, and we do have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. I would also like to welcome our newest oversight committee meeting, Ms. Cindy Barbario Payne. Governor Abbott appointed Ms. Barbario Payne to the CPRIT, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, to the CPRIT Oversight Committee in February. Ms. Barbario Payne, Barbario. Would please read the oath of office. I, Cindy Barbario Payne, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the duties of the Office of CPRIT Oversight Committee Member of the State of Texas and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and this state. So help me God. Congratulations and welcome to the Oversight Committee. Thank you. And we look forward to the time we can all meet in person. Members, the draft minutes from the February 19th Oversight Committee meeting, committee meeting are available in your agenda packet behind tab one. Are there any corrections to the minutes as circulated? None. Hearing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the February 19th Oversight Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, I didn't, motion made by, uh, Mr. Montgomery and a seconded by, I didn't hear. Okay, Dr. Lobrosio. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Our next agenda item is public comment. Public feedback is critically important because Secret was created to help Texans. Opening our meetings with public comment underscores this board's commitment to transparency and accountability. I'd like to recognize 
Mr. Charlie Gagan of the American Lung Association, who is who wishes to speak. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. My name is Charlie Gagan. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the American Lung Association and the Texas Cancer Partnership, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. As the state grapples with the public health crisis of COVID-19 and its impact on the Texas economy, CFRIT is uniquely positioned to both support healthcare services to Texans and serve as an economic engine. I urge you to reverse course on the decision to suspend grant applications for fiscal year 2021 and ensure CFRIT continues to provide life-saving resources to Texans. The legislature designed CFRIT to be independent of the state budget process and to ensure continuous and stable life-saving operations. This design safeguards important programs so they might continue saving even in these hard times. While there may be marginal cost savings to the fiscal year 22-23 budget and reduced debt payments and pausing grant making, the benefits of full funding far outweigh any immediate and short-term savings. The economist Ray Perryman in his economic report on CPRIT states, quote, CPRIT programs generate hundreds of millions of dollars in additional business activity each year and substantial taxes for state and local governments. We estimate that the direct outlays and related multiplier effects of CPRIT operations and programs generate an increase in business activity in Texas, totaling 719 million in GDP and 10,000 jobs. Those are incredible numbers. And as we hear countless news stories of state and local governments struggling with their budgets, now is not the time to hit pause on an important lifeline. Not only does CPRT create economic growth and jobs, but the report also found that for each dollar spent of screening and prevention, leads to more than $24 in treatment cost savings, preserved productivity, and other economic benefits. These screenings help identify deadly cancers early on for Texans who would not normally have access to these services. They help save lives. But CPRT is more than just an economic engine. For many Texans, CPRT means hope. Hope they can access an early detection screening for deadly diseases like lung and colorectal cancer. Hope that they'll have access to cutting edge clinical trials in their own backyard. Hope that their local hospital or clinic can increase its capacities and recruit bright doctors and researchers. CPRT means hope for the lung cancer patient with an EGSR mutation who can no longer do radiation, that there will be more treatment options on the horizon that a new treatment could not only be around the corner, but available and taking place right in her backyard. Continuity of research funding is critical. We know that drug development process can sometimes take decades. It is much more important to ensure nothing disrupts this lengthy and painstaking process. Cancer patients don't have the luxury of waiting an extra year and they don't have that time. Last spring, Texas lawmakers approved HJR 12 in the fall and the voters of Texas resoundingly approved Proposition 6, extending CPRT's life and funding for 10 more years. They, along with Texas lawmakers, wisely approved the use of bond funding so that CPRT's work could continue unabated. I urge you to listen to them and proceed with scheduling a grant deadline for 2021 grant applications and develop an extension and exception policy for grant applicants that are affected by COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gagan. The chair recognizes Mr. Roberts to provide the chief executive officer's report. I have unlimited or limited space, so um, you don't get the pleasure of seeing how long my hair has gotten since we met last. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Margo. Uh, I'll try and make this brief. Uh, the memo in the meeting books uh, is fairly self-explanatory, but uh, I'd like to point out on page 2-3 uh, behind tab two, uh, the grant award funding available, that there are sufficient funds available for today's PIC recommendations. If you folks approve the PIC's recommendations, there will be a balance of almost $115 million remaining for grant awards at the August quarterly OC meeting. So uh, you don't need to, to worry about emptying the barrel today. Uh, just a few points uh, covering CPRT's response to the COVID-19 issues. 
Again, uh, behind uh, this tab, uh, page 2-4, is a couple of pages detailing our response. I would like to uh, call to your attention uh, what I consider to be the, the highlights, if you will. Uh, we established an indefinite 100% remote work policy to staff that is currently in effect. Uh, there is no immediate signs of that changing, though I'm hearing uh, the possibility that uh, we may, uh, as state agencies, mimic uh, the private sector instructions of going to 25%, but that is not a, a done deal yet for, for state offices. We established an internal COVID-19 work group that meets twice a week to resolve questions and guidance for grantees and applications uh, related to COVID-19. These responses are posted pretty quickly on a dedicated landing page on our website. Also, as I think you know already, we cancel all hotel and travel arrangements for peer review meetings in April uh, and conducted the peer review through video conference meetings. Uh, we did, as uh, Mr. Gagan pointed out, notified potential grant application applicants for all three programs that CPRT will not release FY 2021 request for applications until further notice and we withdrew open FY 2021 RFAs that had already been released pursuant, pursuant to our standard pre-COVID-19 schedule. I'll simply say that unfortunately these are unusual times and uh, they necessitate uh, unusual actions. Um, your staff, I think the oversight committee, uh, certainly would like to continue uh, going forward. We think that there is sufficient time uh, to evaluate the situation as we go forward with guidance from state leadership uh, and hope that, that this policy uh, can, be, can be reversed in due course. Uh, also, as you know, uh, we canceled the biennial conference scheduled for July 30 uh, and 31st. Uh, those are the highlights of, of our actions to the COVID-19. And Mr. Margo, uh, I'll be happy to try and entertain any questions you folks may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts? I don't hear any. We'll now move to uh, recognize the chair recognizes Mr. Burgess to present the chief compliance officer's report and to provide the compliance certification for the proposed awards. Good morning, Mr. Margo. You will find my compliance program update uh, on page 3-1 behind virtual tab 3. Just a couple of things I wanted to point out. I'll be brief. Um, as of the end of April, uh, you know, one of the things that we do in the compliance programs, we monitor delinquent reporting. And as of April 28th, we had one uh, report that had not been filed. Uh, we continue to work with our grantees. You know, on average, we have about 560 reports each month that are submitted to CPRIT. And currently, uh, under grant management now we have about 1.4 billion dollars uh, so you know I think the grantees have done really well in getting the reports in now with the current COVID-19 uh, situation we would anticipate that number might rise a bit but we are in constant uh, communication with our grantees to make sure they get those reports in timely another activity uh, yes sir Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just a quick question. Mr. Burgess, what is the what's the current delinquency rate and how is it uh, over time on grantee reports? Usually, I mean, in the past, it's been a really favorable number. I just wonder if we're continuing there. Correct. So uh, we have established a, a 5% threshold, and that's about 28 reports. Uh, a month and we are well below that. Again, the average, uh, I think the report that we just reviewed yesterday, uh, 
the May 17th, 18th report, I think we had a still one report delinquent. So we're, we're doing quite well with that and, and staying well below the 5% threshold. Um, what are the another main activity of the compliance program is we re, produce you know perform a second level review for financial status reports and those reports are due quarterly from each uh, grantee and we performed about 458 of those second level reviews uh, for February March and April but the what I wanted to bring to your attention is, and I want to give kudos to the compliance team, my, my compliance manager, Stephen Nance and the team, and also uh, Heidi's team, specifically um, Ed Doritic. You know, we were able to pivot very quickly when the COVID-19, uh, you know, developed and, and unfolded. And, and Stephen and the team were able to implement a fully electronic review system and process um, for our financial status reports. And we were able to pivot very quickly. And I just want to give kudos to, to the, the team for that. Um, you know, you can't often say that government agencies are nimble, but I think we definitely were uh, in this case. And I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. And lastly, um, uh, actually, two more things very quickly. On-site reviews, we had four of those scheduled, and we, beginning in mid-March, we obviously canceled those on-site reviews. So we have about 12 of those outstanding, and again, those will be uh, scheduled at a later date uh, when, when it's prudent to do so. And lastly, our training and support for our grantees. We held our first series of trainings, March 11 and 12. We had about 200 grantee staff in attendance. Uh, went very well. We have training specific to each program type. And lastly, we conducted uh, a new grantee training and two new authorized signing official trainings. And what was uh, remarkable about that is those three trainings that I just spoke of were fully virtual and kudos to our IT team, uh, our, our staff internally, that it just went off without a hitch uh, and, and we got positive reviews from that. So. Um, Mr. Margo, that's the end of my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? Well, yes. Can I, uh, like, just again, briefly, Mr. Burgess, an on-site review, can that be done? Can you do that by video conference or not? You said you on we we can we haven't really gone there i mean they're they weren't on site themselves and so uh we weren't able to um kind of go that route but as things began to open back up and and these grantee staff began to go back to the office that's definitely something we would entertain yes sir okay thank you can i just do an audio test is anybody able to hear this we do well, I am here, but um, my video apparently doesn't work, so go figure. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. You get the technology award. Um, if there are no further questions for Mr. Burgess, then we will now, Mr. Burgess will now provide the compliance certification report for the proposed awards. Thank you again, Mr. Margo. You'll find my uh, compliance certification report in your proposed grant award booklet. Uh, on page 52, and that memo is dated May 5th, and that information was made available to you in the portal, uh, OC portal. My certification uh, covers and details each step in the application review process, beginning with approval of the RFA all the way through oversight committee approval. And depending on the program type, we document anywhere from 50 to 60 70 unique steps in the process and they are attested to so um, also as part of my compliance certification um, we uh, document those on a compliance pedigree and those were made available to you as well um, we review third-party observer reports so we have third-party uh, folks that sit in each peer review and, and scientific uh, review council meeting and document uh, everything that goes on 
Uh, I review our conflict of interest, sign out sheets and forms, post review statements and attendance sheets. Um, I also attended the program integration committee meeting on May 5th at secret offices. Actually, it was virtual, my bad. Um, and uh, attested the review process was followed. Uh, after reviewing the supporting documentation, uh, Mr. Margo and Oversight Committee members, uh, and in consultation with CEPRA staff and GDIT staff, um, I certified that the review process uh, for the academic research and product development research award recommendations that you're considering today uh, did follow all applicable laws and agency administrative rules. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? Hearing none, we'll move on. Thank you. Chair Thank recognizes you. Dr. Wilson to provide the academic research program update and present the proposed recruitment RFAs for fiscal year 2021. Dr. Wilson will also introduce the Program Integration Committee's grant award recommendations. Yes, yeah, so I'll begin uh, briefly with the um, report from the Academic Research Program. It's on tab four. The, um, as Mr. Uh, Roberts mentioned, the review panels for um, the academic research program met as a video conferencing in April to consider responses to 149 applications. Uh, four RFAs were, were considered core facility support awards, high impact, high risk awards, clinical investigator, the early clinical investigator award that is a new award, and the collaborative action program um, focused on liver cancer in Texas. Those reviews are um, completed and will be um, formally reviewed by the Program Integration Committee later this summer and reported to you in August. Um, I now want to move to the recommendations from the Program Integration Committee for Academic Research Program. And the first slide, if you would, Um, this, these awards um, are focused on three RFAs that are for recruitment. Um, you'll recall that they include first-time tenure-track faculty members. These are um, faculty at the uh, beginning of their career with a $2 million award limit. Um, the recruitment of rising stars targets outstanding early stage investigators who've already demonstrated promise for contributions to cancer research. These awards can be up to $4 million. And then established investigator awards are intended to assist in the recruitment of outstanding senior research faculty who've demonstrated um, exceptional accomplishments and will bring those um, to Texas. Those awards are for up to $6 million. Um, so the next slide shows you that there were uh, 13 awards recommended for the past quarter. These included um, four established investigator, two rising star, and seven first-time tenure-track faculty. Um, I want to take a few minutes just to describe briefly these remarkable individuals who are hopefully going to be recruited to Texas with secret um, support. And the first set are the four established investigator applicants the first is um, Dean Flesher, who was a physician scientist, um, internationally recognized for his um, demonstration of the importance of what's known as oncogene addiction, where cell processes are co-opted by cancer cells to drive forward uh, aggressive cancer behavior. And these are very important in terms of the precision medicine uh, therapeutics that have been developed recently. This award is for $6 million uh, to MD Anderson to enable his recruitment from Stanford. Uh, next is Dr. Wenyi Wee, who is a cancer biologist. Again, someone who focuses on the uh, 
cellular biology of cancer cells with an eye towards identifying vulnerabilities that can be targeted with therapeutics. This award is for $6 million uh, to UT Southwestern to recruit him from Beth Israel, deaconess at Harvard Medical School. Uh, next is Dr. Charles Manning, a um, PET imaging radiochemist who's been instrumental in developing novel approaches for both imaging cancers with PET imaging, but also targeting these with uh, ca uh, cancer therapeutics. Um, this award is for $5 million to MD Anderson to recruit him from Vanderbilt. And then rounding out this uh, group is Dr. Tan Mei Lee. Lee, a cell biologist who has uh, special training in chemical engineering. And this is of interest because he focuses on why the shape of cancer cells is uniquely, un, uh, is uniquely disrupted um, and particularly will focus on this question in uh, a pediatric cancer medulloblastoma. This award is for about $5 million to Texas A&M's engineering experimental station to recruit him from Florida. Uh, the next um, group are two rising star uh, nominees. The first is Veronica Federico, a um, cancer epidemiologist. Her work focuses on the understanding the biology of how environment, diet affects our GI microbiome and how this um, can be influential in the development of colon cancers. This award is for $4 million to MD Anderson to recruit her from Emory University. And Ken Wang is a radiation physicist who specializes in building uh, unique um, imaging capabilities to allow radiation therapists and investigators to use um, animal models in research that allows uh, prog progress in uh, developing novel radiation treatments. This award is for $4 million to UT Southwestern to recruit uh, Dr. Wang from Johns Hopkins. And then um, the next series of slides are seven uh, really quite exceptional individuals that are um, first time tenure track faculty. And I think as all and, uh, past members of this uh, committee recognize, this really is our investment in the future of uh, cancer research in Texas. And what you'll see here is a group that is not only exceptional in uh, potential, but also represents a real diversity of, um, of uh, disciplines and uh, demonstrates also a breadth of institutions that have been successful in recruiting using this mechanism for recruitment. Um, the first is uh, Eric Nordstrom, a computational biologist being recruited to Baylor from UC San Diego. Uh, the second is Lila Romero, a chemist who I wanna make special mention of because she's being recruited to Baylor University from MIT. She's a, a very accomplished uh, chemist who's focused on novel cancer therapies. What's special about her recruitment is that she, do, she joins uh, Dr. John Wood, a uh, secret scholar who was recruited several years ago to Baylor University. And our review team uh, commented on the significant impact of that recruitment to building at Baylor University cancer focus in their chemistry department, which will be further enhanced by Dr. Romero. Next is uh, Robert Hillman, a surgeon scientist whose award will allow his retaining him at MD Anderson. Jason Lee is um, an electrical engineer being recruited to Baylor College of Medicine from University of Colorado Boulder. Next slide. Megan Wesnett is a nurse investigator. She's being recruited with this award to uh, UT Health Science Center's School of Nursing from MD Anderson. She focuses on uh, behavioral approaches to understanding and mitigating um, the side effects of cancer therapeutics. Next is Matthew Parker, a structural biologist being recruited to UT uh, Southwestern from the University of California, Berkeley. And then finally, um, Clementia Tracker, 
who is a veterinary scientist whose recruitment uh, is to Texas Tech University uh, Amarillo, their new school of uh, veterinary medicine. She's uh, accomplished scientists being recruited from St. Jude's. Um, that completes the uh, description of the 13 uh, investigators among these three uh, recruitment groups um, that have been recommended by the PIC for your consideration. Are there any questions for Dr. Wilson? Uh, if I may. Yes, sir. Dr. Wilson, two of the two of the nominees come from Texas organizations and are going to Texas organizations. One of them uh, from MD Anderson to the Health Science Center in Houston. I think the other one from uh, MD Anderson. I just I just wonder, do we have any concern that we're just uh, cannibalizing our own institutions? Well, um, I guess no. Um, First of all, uh, uh, I, the um, Robert Hillman, who's the uh, surgeon investigator, is being retained at MD Anderson. Um, this award right. will enable that. And as a consequence, um, one of the things that I would mention is that it's very hard to convince our Scientific Review Council uh, that it's a good move to retain a trainee because of concerns about uh, whether the mentors will allow their independence. And one of the strengths of Dr. Hillman's or MD Anderson's application was a mentoring plan that assured in a very convincing manner that this exceptional talent would be um, able to develop independent of his, um, his current mentors. But regarding um, the nurse investigator, Megan Wisnett, this is a very exciting um, opportunity for the School of Nursing at uh, UT Health Science Center to build their expertise in cancer. And of course, um, there's probably no better place for training such individuals than MD Anderson. So I think that actually these are very strong uh, recruitment. I think you also are aware that um, we don't allow uh, internal recruitments for the rising star or established uh, investigator awards. But I think that um, there's now maybe about 10% of the first time tenure track faculty who um, were trained in Texas. And I think this is uh, proving to be a very positive opportunity. Thank you. If there are no further questions for uh, Dr. Wilson, Mr. Burgess is certified compliance of the academic research award process. It is my understanding that no oversight committee member reported any conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest that members have not reported? Hearing none, members, you have the list of applications and grant amounts recommended by the PIC for the academic research grant awards. We will approve the PICS recommendation at two thirds of the oversight committee members present and able to vote to do so. Dr. Wilson presented three academic research award slates. Rather than taking a separate vote on the different grant mechanisms constituting 13 grant recommendations, I will ask for a vote to approve all the slates. If a member wants to consider one or more award recommendations individually, please make a motion to do so now. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the PICS recommendations for the following academic research grant award mechanisms. Recruitment of first time tenure track faculty members, recruitment of established investigators, and recruitment of rising stars. Is there a motion? Okay. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I will entertain a motion delegating contract negotiating, uh, negotiation authority to the CEO and CPRT staff and to authorize the CEO to sign the contracts on behalf of CPRT. So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 
Any opposed? Members, closing out our action items for the academic research program, I will entertain a motion approving the proposed FY2021 recruitment RFAs as presented by Dr. Wilson. So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The chair recognizes Mrs. Majid to provide the prevention program update and present the proposed FY 2021 prevention program RFAs. Good morning, everyone. Um, my report can be found on page 5-1. Peer review for cycle 20.2 was held on May the 12th by um, video conference. And the, those applications will go on to the review council and then um, their recommendations to the PIC Program Integration Committee, and they will be presented to the Oversight Committee at the, its August meeting. If there are no questions about my very brief report, I will um, would like to request approval for FY 2021 RFAs. And in the event that the current suspension is lifted, a proposed timeline for the release of these RFAs will, will be presented for your approval at a later date. The four mechanisms as um, proposed are um, the same ones that we have offered in the past, the evidence-based cancer prevention services, tobacco control and lung cancer screening, expansion of cancer prevention services to rural and medically underserved populations, and the dissemination of DPRIP-funded cancer control interventions. The Prevention Review Council and the Prevention Advisory Committee have recommended some changes to the expansion mechanism. An application for a second expansion would not be required to further expand services or geographic area but would be required to substantially increase the number of clinical services provided. This award would um, be for a maximum of $2.5 million for a maximum of five years. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the members may have. Are there any questions? Members, I will entertain a motion approving the proposed FY 2021 Prevention Program RFAs as presented. So moved. Moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The chair recognizes Dr. Walker Peach to present the product development research update and award recommendation. Good morning, members, and uh, thank you all for your flexibility in meeting us in this brave new world of video conferencing. So my, uh, for the first part of my discussion this morning will be an update on the product development program. The second part will be the um, a proposed awards. So do, please do recall that most product development awards fall um, on two different cycles during the year, one in February and one in August. You may recall that in February, at the February OC meeting, we brought forward four seed awards for your approval, which were, uh, were approved by the oversight committee. However, the PDRC had placed one applicant, one additional applicant in a different category. We call that the no action um, category until that applicant had provided additional information to the PDRC. I, I'm pleased to announce at this point that the PDRC received the information, they have reviewed it, and they have made um, a recommendation, which I will discuss um, during the second part of, my, of uh, uh, the review this morning. So that, is, that will then conclude um, cycle one for physical year 2020. Moving forward to cycle two, and again, this is all found behind tab six in your, in your um, packet. Uh, cycle two of physical year 2020 can be found on page uh, 6-2. Um, table, uh, I'm sorry, 6-3. Uh, table three reflects the current application data. We did review, I'm sorry, we did um, intake 28 applications for this, for this award cycle. Um, eight of those were invited to our video conference in-person uh, peer review meeting. 
and four of those have moved now into uh, into diligence. I anticipate bringing these forward for your, if there are any recommended by the PDRC and the PIC, I'll bring them forward for your approval during the August Oversight Committee uh, meeting. So that concludes then the physical year 2020 um, cycle one and cycle two update. Moving forward now with the 2021, physical year 2021, cycle one and cycle two updates. As you know, uh, cycle one has been suspended at this point. Um, we uh, would love to bring that, that cycle both for all uh, three of the approved RFAs that were, that were previously approved forward. If we get guidance from state leadership that we can do that, I am confident that the program could bring that uh, first cycle for fiscal year 2020 uh, forward very quickly. We would not have that fall on our regular funding cycle during the, the, the calendar year, however, but I am very confident that we could bring that up very quickly if we were to gain um, uh, information from state leadership that we, we have adequate budget to support that. Having said that about cycle one, I'm very um, confident that cycle two will move forward. This is one that has already been approved by the oversight committee and we will, would initiate that in November of this year, November 2020. Very hopeful that our budget will be able to support both cycle one and cycle two. So let me pause there for a moment to see if there are any questions with regard to the update, the program update. Dr. Hernandez has some questions. Good morning. Yes, uh, uh, just a few questions. Number one, uh, and a, first, a comment, I'm very, I like this project. It's very exciting to see how T-cells are being used to identify and increased immune oncology, so it's very exciting. Um, is this uh, project also, when I was reading into it, I couldn't find anything on, is there any co-stimulatory domains being used on this project by the investigator or not? Uh, so my apologies, are you referring to our proposed award, which I had not spoken about yet? Yes, that's what I'm speaking okay, about. So that's what I'm saying. I'll, I will, no, I'll, sorry I'll about discuss that. that I just wanted to pause briefly to see if there are any questions first about any program updates. Okay, hearing none, may I move forward then? Uh, Mr. Margo, may I move forward with, the, yes. with talking about our proposed award? Oh, very well. Okay, so I'm very happy to uh, bring forward the final applicant in cycle 20.1 uh, for your approval. Uh, we did release three, the three standard product development grant mechanisms for 20.1, the TEXCO, RELCO, and TEED uh, mechanisms. Please do remember that four have already been approved during the February 2020 OC meeting. The no action applicant did require some additional information, and there was additional diligence done by the PDRC on this applicant. And I'm very pleased now to bring forward for your approval one relocation application, uh, relocation applicant. Um, and for reference, please see the PDRC chair's uh, letter on page 38 of the uh, proposed awards um, booklet, as well as my memo on page 28. Um, the proposed award would be to a company called Invictus USA Inc. They are a Paris-based relocation applicant, very exciting drug development company. It is a biopharmaceutical company focused on the development of uh, innovative immunotherapy approaches to treat cancers. This company is, was founded in 2010, has had several rounds of venture um, backing, and they proposed to relocate to the Houston area in order to continue their collaboration with, uh, with their collaborator at MD Anderson. The company is developing a very novel human leukocyte antigen G, a CAR-T platform, or HLA-G CAR-T platform for the treatment of solid tumors that have been shown to be resistant to immunotherapy. The approach is um, essentially reprogramming immune cells to be killer cells for certain tumor types that express HLAG. So the end game is this could potentially increase responsiveness of immunotherapies for certain cancer popu patient populations. They have two initial disease indications. They're going after killer cell renal carcinoma as well as ovarian cancer. And the PDRC has recommended no contract contingencies for this award. We're very pleased about that. Okay, so this is the recommendation. So previously, there have been four seed awards recommended at the February OC. We are now bringing one relocation award forward for your approval, a, a second, I'm sorry, a drug development company with a total uh, budget request for this award of $14,196,990. If approved by the OC, 
This would be the 14th relocation company to join Secret's company portfolio. And with that, I will, I'll stop. And, and are there any questions now with regard to um, Invictus? Dr. Hernandez? I'm sorry, Cindy. I'm, I was, I've been drinking too much coffee, so I apologize. I no worries. <laughs> So oh, um, I, I was looking at their at their projects, and I guess let me let me back up a little. So their total investment in this venture to move to Houston is uh, how much are they investing in the in the Houston area? So their request from Seaport is fourteen million one hundred and ninety six thousand nine hundred ninety dollars. Their prior venture of um, um, a raises are around forty million euro, and that is from Crunchbase. Right, but is that what they've invested in the Houston community, or they have not invested a single dollar, and we're putting in the 14 million? That's what I'm trying to figure that, out. That's right. So the company has not actually relocated to Houston at this point. Secret rules allow the company a year to actually relocate into the area that they they propose to move to. So their proposal right now is to go to Houston because they already have a collaborator at MD Anderson. Well, that's great news. Now, some of the questions always come up. Uh, and I know uh, the mayor also gets this, is uh, that's fine. They can come over. We're excited that they work with our uh, great companies. And I know you and I have touched on what I'm about to say. Um, what is, there is evident economic development. There's so many jobs that are going to be created also in this venture. There's also uh, financial benefits for the that area on top of research. And there's also, I'm assuming, some sort of not, I wouldn't say clawback, but a benefit either the taxpayers so they're going to get a dividend they're going to get something out of this venture despite healing human beings from cancer and, and making them better uh, this capital investment does have a return of investment of some kind i'm assuming that's correct so all of the this is not just true for this company this is true for all secret companies there are a tails associated with the launch of the product in the form of royalties that come back to secret um, and it differs depending on which type of company it is. It's a drug development company, so the percentage royalty is slightly different than a device company. But absolutely, there is payback in the form of product launch royalties that come back to to Cypress. That is correct. Yes, ma'am. And obviously, I don't know if you noticed right off the top of your head, but I know it creates a lot of jobs, a lot of high-paying jobs, and that's uh, beneficial to the uh, Houston market as well. So that's also a plus to our economy. So I don't know if you can, if you have that information with you. If not, it's okay. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, what, what's the, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. What is the question? There, there's always job creations and there's always a, a financial benefit to the market, to the Houston market from having companies relocate any company to a city. And they always create a, a great economic benefit. And I just want our, uh, our audience to understand that uh, these companies are coming in not only to save human life, but they're also creating great jobs and adding a great uh, resource to the Houston market. And I don't know if you, you had that data with you or not. So I don't have a particular data with regard to what a, what a single company landing in Houston might bring. I can tell you that they intend to hire a number of individuals um, in the Houston area. The first one being the CEO. So they absolutely intend to hire at the pretty much the executive management level in the Houston. Well, I don't realize they've indicated that they would be uh, based in Houston. These individuals will be based in Houston, but they probably are, may not come from the Houston area. They could, but they may not. Well, great. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. I remind the uh, members that Mr. Burgess is certified compliance of the product development award process. It's my understanding that no oversight committee member reported any conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest that members have not reported? Members, the PIC has recommended approval of a grant award to Invectus USA for an amount not to exceed $14,196,999. Nine, $990. We will approve the PIC's recommendation if two thirds of the oversight committee members present and able to vote do so. I will entertain a motion to approve the PIC's recommendation for Invectus USA. Over. Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I will entertain a motion delegating contract negotiation authority to the CEO 
and Seifert staff and to authorize the CEO to sign the contract on behalf of Seifert. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Members, Mr. Roberts notified the board on May 13th that he seeks authority to disperse grant funds in advance to Invectus USA. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts regarding this request, his request? Pursuant to the General Appropriations Act, Article 9, Section 4.03, Subsection A, do I have a motion to authorize Secret to disperse grant funds via advance payments to Invectus USA upon execution of the award contract and the successful completion of the tranches. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. The chair recognizes Mr. Roberts to present his appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program review panels. Thank you, Mr. Margo. Pursuant to law, I have appointed three experts to Seifert's Product Development Review Council. Our statute requires that the Oversight Committee approve my appointments. The nomination subcommittee discussed the appointments at its meeting on May 15th and recommended that the Oversight Committee vote to approve the appointments. In addition, the Product Development Subcommittee also reviewed these nominations on May 14th. I request your approval. Are there any questions for Mr. Roberts or the nomination subcommittee? Is there a motion to approve the three scientific research and prevention program committee appointments as presented by Mr. Roberts? No moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any, opposed, any opposed? The motion carries. Chair, uh, members, our next so several agenda items are the presentations from the oversight committee's five advisory committees. Seifert has provided all the advisory committee reports prior to the meeting and I hope you have had a chance to review them. I will recognize Mr. Roberts to provide some background on the advisory committees and their role. But before I do, I want to talk about the process for asking questions. Each advisory committee will have 30 minutes to present their recommendations and to respond to questions from the oversight committee members. Please hold your questions until the advisory committee completes their presentation. If you have a question, raise your hand so that we can see, see you on the screen. Ms. Doyle will note that you have a question and will assist me by calling on members individually to ask their questions. Are there any questions or comments before I recognize Mr. Roberts? Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Margot. Briefly, uh, as I've reported previously, Pre-COVID-19, we'd planned that today's meeting would culminate two and a half months of Seifert staff and oversight committee members meeting with stakeholders across Texas about ideas for Seifert 2.0. We purposely planned for all five of these advisory committees to make their statutorily required annual presentations today with their recommendations helping to inform the plan for 2.0. These, this draft would be discussed at public events this summer and finalized by November, along with your FY22 program priorities. Because most of the planned outreach activities are delayed due to COVID-19, the advisory committee reports will now serve as the start of the conversation for what we hope CEPRT can accomplish over the next decade. A large part of today's time is devoted to these presentations. We've allocated 30 minutes for each report, including answering questions from the Oversight Committee. These committees take their statutory role advising you very seriously and have met numerous times over the recent months to develop these annual reports and recommendations. It's my expectation 
that these reports will significantly inform operational plans for the next 10 years and to specifically affect your 2022 program priorities. Mr. Margo, I'll turn it back to you. Need your need your mic on. I'm, I'm like Dr. Rice. Uh, Dr. Wilson, please introduce Dr. Osborne, who will provide the University Advisory Committee's annual report. Yes, uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Ken Osborne, who is the director of the Dan Duncan Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Osborne took um, leadership of the Duncan Center in 2005, and uh, it rapidly became NCI designated. And then under his leadership um, in uh, 2015, it was elevated to an NCI comprehensive cancer center. Um, he is a physician scientist whose career is focused on understanding the biology of breast cancer with an eye to then developing novel therapies and pursuing clinical trial approaches. Um, he is uh, the current chair of our university advisory committee. And he's also uh, was the uh, founding chair of our clinical trials advisory committee. And in this uh, forum, he's going to provide reports on behalf of the university advisory committee and clinical trials advisory committee. Uh, thank you, Kent, for being here. Thanks, Jim. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, hope everybody yeah. is well. Can I have the first slide, please? So this slide just shows our membership on the committee. There's three new people as shown by the stars in red. Uh, it's a pretty good distribution around the state. I'm from Baylor. Michelle Barton is the past chair at MD Anderson. Peter Davies from Texas A&M is the current vice chair. Claudia Newhauser from the University of Houston. Dan Niesel from UTMB. Dr. Shamu from Rice. Joe Heppert from Texas Tech. Carlos Artiaga from UT Southwestern, the new Cancer Center Director there, and Ruben Mesa, the Cancer Center Director at UTHOCSA. Finally, Walter Horton from Texas State, and John Wood from Baylor University. Next slide. <clears throat> we had four meetings over the past year. Dates shown there, February 25th in 2019, September, November, and then again in March of this year. <clears throat> Our agendas are summarized there mostly talking about reauthor reauthorization, uh, ideas for the next uh, CPRIT 2.0, the impact of the CPRIT impact and uh, value to the state, program up updates and funding, research priorities, metrics of success, and then finally the impact of COVID-19, which I will discuss in part. Next slide. So and to start with, why is CPRIT so important? And that's summarized here. Obviously first to reduce morbidity and mortality from cancer through research, education and prevention, to provide funding at a time when federal funding for research was declining. That has reversed itself over the past couple of years slightly, but um, when CPRIT was first organized, the funding from the federal government for research was declining significantly. Third, funding for infrastructure, not easily obtained from other funding sources, like recruitment grants, like core resource grants. You can't get that money from NIH funding or NCI funding very easily. Fourth, to upgrade our research and healthcare capabilities in Texas, <clears throat> provide stable, high quality jobs. And number six, which I think is very important, diversify the Texas economy with new biotech, pharma, and healthcare. And then finally, as someone mentioned earlier, CPRIT paid for itself uh, as outlined by the report from the Perryman Group. Next slide. <clears throat> this slide just summarizes the funding status where we are today, at least as of February the 20th, for the three major areas. Academic research programs, 1.7 billion. Prevention programs, 263 million product development for and 40 million for a total expenditure of $2.4 billion of the 3 billion all allocated. Next slide. <clears throat> the academic research program funding is shown here. Core facilities and shared resources, 
And also on the on the far right column, you'll see follow-on funds. Those are funds that the group then received or applied for and received uh, from outside agencies after getting their secret award. And they're fairly substantial. So core facilities, 223 million and shared instrumentation awards, which are similar of importance, 36 million. Early translational research awards, you see high impact, high research awards, multi-investigator research awards. And then one of the biggest categories is the individual investigator research awards for uh, 511 uh, billion, uh, million and uh, 321 million on follow-up funds. And the scholar funds also, recruitment funds, 603 million and 44 million in follow-on funds, which is really spectacular considering that many of the investigators have only been here for a few years and are just now acquiring their outside grants. And then research training awards. Next slide. So examples of impact, I'm gonna show several of these. Obviously there's been a lot of examples. I'll show you some. I'll focus on those from Baylor because those are the ones I know the best. Uh, and there's many new investigators to Texas, including over the past five years, 24 established investigator awards. Chris Amos from at Baylor, quantitative scientist who was the deputy director of the Cancer Center at Dartmouth, was recruited to Baylor a couple of years ago. Carlos Artiaga, who I trained back in the 80s, came from Vanderbilt to be the Cancer Center director at UT Southwestern. Gail Eckert, who I also helped to train when she was at San Antonio when I was there, came from the University of Colorado to be the head of the cancer program at the new Dell Medical School. And Patrick Sung at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, an outstanding scientist. These are just four examples of the kind of people that we can bring to the state with these recruitment awards. They also had excellent follow-in funds from the awardees, as I mentioned. And they brought in new and strengthened several important research programs, quantitative science, genetic epidemiology, Proteogenomics, that is the study of proteins. You heard all about the study of DNA and RNA. Now we're going to the study of proteins, which are important for new drug development, and then experimental therapeutics. So all these are very important areas for cancer research in the state. Next slide. <clears throat> what about core facility awards? We view these as also extremely important. They provide research support for multiple investigators at an institution and several institutions. Baylor, for instance, has a memorandum of understanding with MD Anderson. They can use our shared resources and we can use theirs. In fact, anybody in the Texas Medical Center can use our resources. CEPRA provides a unique mechanism for funding that you can't get elsewhere. One, ex one example here at Baylor is the Center for Drug Discovery that I'll tell you a little bit more about later which provides screening and development of drugs targeting newly discovered cancer drivers by the researchers in our institution and others in the Texas Medical Center. Also, the proteomic shared resource that we were funded has become an outstanding resource, sophisticated analysis of key proteins in cancer that has resulted in new drug targets and biomarkers for cancer. It has also allowed us to become leaders in the NCI CPTAC program, that's the clinical proteomics tumor analysis consortium program that replaced the genomics program that NCI launched back uh, 15 years ago that has now been largely completed. Now we're doing protein analysis and proteogenomics of cancer to more accurately identify drivers for drug development. And then the Adolescent and Childhood Cancer Epidem Epidemiology and Susceptibility Service that provides genetic and environmental susceptibility factors in children across the state. Next slide. So this is a center, this is an example, a concrete example for the center of drug discovery that I want to just mention. So if somebody, an investigator in Texas or anywhere else for that matter, identifies a pure a, a new protein driver, they purify that protein and they give it to this core facility. The core facility then, with only with an expense of seven thousand dollars, most of the time these drug screens cost hundreds of thousands of dollars they can screen 4.4 billion compounds that are barcode, barcoded with a piece of DNA so they can be identified. You mix all the, you mix these uh, compounds together with the protein and then isolate the binders, decode by doing the sequencing of the DNA that's linked to it. You get the compounds of interest 
you resynthesize those, do some optimization studies, and then license what you found to an outside entity or develop a Baylor company. Along with this, we had developed a collaboration with the University of Houston College of Pharmacy with a P20 planning grant from the NCI. And we recently uh, awarded seven pilot grants of new proteins to discover drugs uh, to this core facility. And let me just show you some examples. Next slide. So uh, the, the, the top part just shows the target that was identified by our researchers and then the status of it and then the grant submitted. And look at that. Grant submitted based on the results of this uh, pilot study using the CPRID core resulted in two NIH grants are already two additional CPRID grants and an American Cancer Society grants. So six of the seven targets have been validated. There are possible candidate drugs. Four grants, two CPRID were submitted on the base, basis of the preliminary data. Here, this is very inexpensive, $7,000 per target. The core can be used by many investigators. It's useful for developing drugs for targets discovery, discovered by our own researchers and drug discovery for orphan cancers or targets for which drug companies are not interested in to spend the money to develop. Next slide. <clears throat> what about prevention and screening? This has also, in our view, been a very successful venture for, uh, for our secret. Next slide. This just shows a few examples of our own program called the uh, Community Outreach and Engagement Program with the use of CPRID awards that affect colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, HPV vaccination, liver cancer, and lung cancer. You can see the results. For colorectal cancer, we increased the blood, blood in the stool testing from 10% to 36%. And this is in an underserved patient population can you imagine only 10% of these patients had colorectal cancer screening before this? Now it's up to 30%. And we've actually swamped the, the colonoscopy suites at Harris Health. Cervical cancer screening has gone up from 29 to 79%. No one should die of cervical cancer in this country. It's ridiculous that anybody does. And yet only 29% were being screened in our population. HPV vaccination to prevent cervical and head and neck cancer. There's been a 50% increase in the rate in the vaccine completion due to the CPRIT grant that we had. Liver cancer screening, there's a 25% increase in hepatitis C screening from eight, uh, up to 18% of 82,000 screen naive patients. And finally, smoking cessation shown there. Next slide. The Mays Cancer Center at the University of to, uh, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Go, go back a slide. Oh, forward. Nope. Something screwed up here. That one. Yes. Whoop. Right after that. Next one. There you go. So they also had a tobacco cessation uh, program funded by CPRIT at the Mays Cancer Center. You can see there, they've had a long-term cessation rate of 21%, which is outstanding for smoking cessation. It's harder to get off cigarettes than it is to cocaine, uh, the people that are expert in this area say. 800 years of life gained, 1,056 quality of life, 65 million in individual smoking costs saved, 9.5 million in averted healthcare costs from smoking, and they had two follow-on grants to expand this program to whites and African Americans in more rural and low income urban areas. And they also have funding for a Facebook Messenger chat adapted to EMR screen, smoking and advice on cessation or prevention. Next slide. What about individual investigator awards? Well, there's been many new discoveries, too many to, to mention here, that provide a new understanding of cancer biology and genetics identification of new cancer driver genes for drug development, new targets for drug development, new drugs or treatment strategies have been developed. And these individual investigator awards provide building blocks uh, for translation to the clinic. If you think of research in medicine being like a pyramid, these inv individual investigator basic science awards provide the base of the pyramid for which discoveries can be then be go up the pyramid to be translated at the top. 
new strategies for lead compounds for product development, and preliminary data for additional federal grants. Next slide. Here's the summary of the academic research program funding, which you can look at at your leisure. And if you look at the follow-on funds to the right, they're pretty impressive. Um, next slide, please. This is one example that shows several aspects of what CPIP can do. So this is a, a study uh, where the cancer, our cancer center provided pilot money that then led to a CPRIT high risk, high reward uh, grant. And what, these, what these guys did, they, they were interested in preventing radiation dermatitis, one of the side effects of radiation where the skin gets burned or if you're having uh, radiation to the head and neck area, your uh, neck and throat get burned from the radiation, very unfortunate complication. So they were interested in preventing that. So they screened 130,000 molecules to find inhibitors of inflammation and fibrosis. And to their surprise, what drug popped up that they could easily change, that they could easily modify? Nexium, the antacid that's commonly used. And so they formulated as a meprazole, which is the generic form of Nexium, into a cream called Dermaprazole. And then they studied it in mice, and you can see the pictures there. If you look on the right-hand side compared to the left-hand side, you can easily see the ulcers from the radiation in the mouse on the left-hand side, and almost complete prevention or treatment on the right-hand side. So they didn't optimize the dose. They, they found it was superior to steroid use, which is a typical treatment in a human 3D skin model. And then they recently applied to the FDA for an IND to study in people. And they've licensed this technology to Shawshank Therapeutics as a topical treatment for radiation dermatitis. And based on this preliminary data, I think it's going to be a, a major advance to prevent this complication in patients. Next slide. Product development awards have also uh, been successful. Early stage companies in Texas or company relocation or seed awards for startup companies. 46 awards totaling $440 million. 25 Texas companies, 16 spin outs from Texas University. 13 relocated companies, I guess that's going up to 14 now. Seed awards to startups. 17 are already conducting clinical trials. There's 3.3 billion follow on funding from venture capital largely. 677 jobs created. Several products launched. And there's the location of these companies, Houston, 20, Austin, 8, Dallas, 6, San Antonio, 3. Next slide. Examples of the impact. UT Southwestern discovered five drug candidates in their basic research, translated to the commercial sector. Three secret funded companies, Peloton, Barricade, and Oncodano. Peloton was bought by Merck for $1.1 billion. Baylor College of Medicine, uh, here on We've got a very strong CAR T cell and adoptive T cell program for immunotherapy of cancer. They found effective T cell treatment of viruses that commonly cause death in the post bone marrow transplant setting. And they targeted these T cells to the viruses themselves and found a 92% response rate. This was licensed to a Baylor spinner called Elevator. Elevator secured a whole bunch of money, including a big CPRA grant and $110 million for doing pivotal studies. Unfortunately, this is the problem. Elevator then moved to Boston. Okay, and that's the one we'll talk about next. Next slide. So the issues with product development is a product development program in, in the eyes of our university advisory committee. I'm not an expert in this area, so much of this comes from other people who are on our committee. But uh, product development, as you know, is a high-risk, expensive venture, and many companies fail. Outside funding is difficult to obtain in Texas. We're not a venture capital mecca here. It requires a long startup. Small companies must license to large companies to complete the process of clinical development. Infrastructure, business hub, and critical mass are lacking. Difficult to import talent to run startups here. Poor decisions by inexperienced leaders. Bellicom, another company that was developed at, at, out of Baylor with uh, T-cell therapy, um, has a product, an excellent product. The company CEO made some bad decisions. They fired him, and Bellicom then moved to San Francisco. Oliver is doing well, the other company that came out of Baylor, but they moved to Boston. So the science is great, the products are good, 
but development of the product is a hang up. And I think the biggest problem is a critical mass of research. Next slide. So just as an example, we think of Texas and Texas Medical Center in Houston as being, you know, a really, really top place. And of course it is, but when you compare it to other places, we really lag behind. This is a map showing all the cancer centers um, in the United States, 71 of them, I believe. And you can see on the East Coast and on the West Coast, California has 10 itself. We have four in Texas, three of which are comprehensive. And there's a smattering in the, uh, in the Midwest. But if you look at the research funding, NIH research funding in these different areas, seven, almost seven billion, all focused in a small area of New York, Boston, Connecticut, and New Jersey. If you add up all of Texas, it's 1.4 billion. And if you add up California, it's 4.7 billion. So relative to the places where there is a really good biotech and, and ph pharmaceutical industry presence, they have a lot more research from the NIH. And that's why the companies are there, because that's where the research is ongoing. Next slide. This just shows NCI funding. California, this is from the National Cancer Institute. California, 554 million. Massachusetts, 396. New York, 403. Maryland, because of NIH, 640. Pennsylvania, 322. Texas is down to 274. Now, we're still pretty high relative to many other states, but uh, we're not near what they are in terms of the two east, east and west coasts. Next slide, please. So possible solutions for this problem with, with uh, product development. And this, these were provided by Joe Heppert at Texas Tech and Kim Graham at Texas Tech and Malcolm Brenner at Baylor, who's had a lot of experience developing these spinouts from our program here. They believe that we need to build the infrastructure or the ecosystem first. Enhance biomedical research in Texas to match the East and West Coast and become the South Coast. Focus on homegrown early stage companies and provide initial seed funding. This require the ultimate will require separate academic partners, external partners, state and local resources. One of the problems is recruiting and maintaining talented CEOs. And to do that, you need an infrastructure and a hub. These guys move from one company to the next. So if they if they are in Boston or in New York, they have, they're with a company there and their company fails, they can move to the next company because there's one right next door without moving their families. And that's been a problem here. Develop a pipeline of Texas-based startups for follow-on secret funding. Build sustainable venture capital economic development partnership through initial startups. Next slide. Okay, let me turn to the temporary, temporary hold on secret funding that you've heard about and where, where the University Advisory Committee stands with regard to that. We think it's gonna provide a loss of important momentum. NCI funding is an example. Over the 10 years that CEPRA has been functioning, increased substantially in Texas centers, increased 8% at MD Anderson, 18% at San Antonio, 59% at Baylor, and 267% at UT Southwestern, largely because we increased our cancer presence through recruitment and our ability to get other outside funding. Excellent candidates in the recruitment pipeline. That is, candidates that we started to recruit, they're out there now, and they're trying to decide whether to come. It's early in their recruitment, but now we can't recruit them because the last uh, RFA or the last application deadline is June the 20th. Closing down even temporarily prevention programs and core resources due for renewal would require extensive restarts. It's hard to set up a big prevention service program and then stop the funding of it. Delay development of biotech ecosystem and hub, which I just talked about. National prestige would suffer and would interrupt building a needed biomedical research critical mass to compete with the other coast and to diversify our economy. Next slide. So the recommended priorities for the future for Secret 2.0. We believe that the two top possibilities are recruitment awards and core facilities because you can't fund those by other mechanisms and they're so important for research and for the state. Prevention and screening programs are also very important and have done a lot of a lot of good, a few examples of which I showed you earlier. Training the next generation scientists and physicians, of course, is important. 
individual investigator awards are important because they, they supply the basic information needed for our product development and clinical translational research. Clinical trial infrastructure and to the served rural and underserved areas that I'll talk about next. Product development, consider a redesign strategy. Avoid focused RFAs. Let researchers do what they know how to do. The discoveries will happen when you least expect them. Continue secret, at least the major priorities if possible. It's a great program for Texas needed by us to reach our full maturity as a biomedical mecca. I think that's the last slide. Thank you. I'll answer any questions if I can. Any questions, Dr. Hernandez? Yes, sir. Great presentation. Um, a few clarifications. The company that left to San Francisco and uh, Boston, what was our total secret investment in those companies? Um, I don't know what Bellicon, I think Bellicon was a $7 million grant, $7 million grant initially. And then Alavir was this, had the slide I showed you, which was, I think, $9 million from secret. And I don't know if you know this or not, and uh, maybe Wayne knows this, but do we have in our contracts, when I, I'm a big proponent in uh, partnering with the private sector, and I, I, don't, I don't mind doing that because they're, they're very innovative, and I, I agree that we need this investment. I'm just concerned of the fact that uh, we're giving our money, and uh, the concern I have, Mr. Chairman, is do we have clawbacks when we do these uh, typical investments with the private sector? If they decide to leave in a certain time period or they don't pay jobs or they Opinion. 
then they got they have to pay us back because if we could have used that money somewhere else on another venture in Texas to keep Texas companies and keep Texas employed and to help save lives. That's all. That's all I was commenting on. Yeah. And, and, and that is an excellent point, Dr. Hernandez. The three years that they have to remain in Texas is after we have stopped giving them money. So obviously they have to be in, in Texas the whole time that we are, you know, that they are receiving money from the free press, but for three years after they receive those funds, they have to stay in Texas or they have to pay us back the, the amount of the grant. Um, and that's the penalty. Now these are, you know, this is, in our administrative rule, it's a policy that we've discussed with the Oversight Committee and the Product Development Subcommittee. It was recommended first by the Product Development Subcommittee. But as we look to Super 2.0 and what issues we need to tweak to better accomplish our objectives, that's, that's definitely something that we should be talking about. And we also, so this is really Cindy, I'd like, like to break in. Dr. Like to Hernandez, wait, just a second, Cindy. Dr. Hernandez and, and all Oversight Committee members, I will say, the Product Development Advisory Committee will be making a presentation also. So, you know, that's a good, a good conversation to have with them, too. Wonderful. Thank you. So if, if I could add a couple of more pieces as well. Um, so the, the rules are for Cindy speaking. Um, the criteria were developed a number of years ago, um, how to classify a company as Texas based. So that's this has been useful for Seaford over the last several years. I think it's an open question at this point as to whether those rules would be useful going forward. And there's been some discussion around how those may be modified for Secret 2.0, and that's something we continue to bring up in the advisory committee. And we will, we will be taking that up uh, very seriously uh, during the next advisory committee as well. So okay, that, that also added a little more flavor. Thank you. I think there are other questions. Dean Craig here. I have two uh, two quick questions for Dan. And then uh, Mr. Montgomery. Uh, uh, Dan, on the follow-on funds, did that fund does that include uh, internal institutional follow-on funds, or was it just external follow-on funds? Those are external funds. Oh, well, th thank you. That uh, makes it even uh, more impressive. Thank you. Um, the uh, other question is what when when you showed the number of uh, uh, funds raised by different uh, regions, uh, don't you think a lot of that has a historical basis, whereas New York and San Francisco, sort of the coast, have a long history of pharma and biotech, whereas Texas and one of the object and one of the objects of, objectives of CPRINT is we started uh, with not much and we're growing the um, uh, infrastructure for biotech fairly fast here, but it'll take a little while to catch up, but we're doing it at a pretty good rate. Do you, do you think that's accurate? Uh, of course, it's historical in the sense that uh, there were major academic univer research universities located in those places, and those uh, spinoffs just grew up around those research. And I think my, our only point from the University Advisory Committee was, yeah, we're making some progress. Maybe we should look at different strategies. And I think I, if I were doing the product development, I would include some of the people that I had in my slide who've given a lot of thought to this, Jill Heppert and, and Malcolm Brenner, at least get some advice from them on what to do. But I think, um, yeah, I, my point was that we need to not only just bring in pro new companies or start up new companies, we need to increase the overall research effort here. And, ha and have more research researchers and more research funding in some way in order to bring those other play other uh, companies and so forth to the state. We're doing it slowly, but I think the, the biggest thing that from our point of view is increased research. Thank you, much appreciated. Mr. Montgomery. Dr. Osborne, Will Montgomery, just following up on what you just now said and looking at your presentation, you say a couple of things, one of which is avoid focused R RFAs. I don't quite get that. You mean yeah. too much focus? Because the focus we have now is pretty broad. It's core facilities, rising stars, established investigators. No, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about saying, uh, oh, let's study colon cancer or let's study pediatric cancer. Let's do this. I think um, 
when you it's it, NCI try I, I've been around for 45 years now doing research and the NCI tried this many many years ago in what they called various task forces so they had the breast cancer task force I'm a breast cancer researcher so I was involved in that this is back in the 80, early 80s and um, the breast cancer task force was designed to to target breast cancer for money it just didn't work uh, it's a good idea on paper that is you're going to bring people in to focus on breast cancer but it turns out that a discovery in somebody working on colon cancer might also apply to breast cancer so why target the money in a very specific way and th that program failed and uh and i i think that was the concern that we had here is if you target the money too much you're going to miss uh miss some opportunities next question is you your list of the committee's list of recommendations starts with recruitment awards core facilities prevention screening programs and then uh also talks about that you know we need to attract a bigger ecosystem of venture capital and experienced ceos and those sort of things you know we spend secret spends about two-thirds of its money on academic research are you suggesting that's not enough or are you because the two attracting you know product development and research is kind of a balance we don't have unlimited funds so how do you apportion them are you all recommending reapportioning money towards product development and away from research or the other way around and no, I'm a little I, I, to prioritize research when we already do that yeah, first of all, I think we were thinking about what would we do if CPRIT could only open a part, or not, not open at all, but maybe open just a little bit, what would we prioritize? And we thought that the recruitment grants are the, by far the most important because they are a big payoff. Uh, shared resources are also important because they help a lot of people and they're hard to get that money from the NIH or other sources. And so uh, that list was thinking about what do we do if secret continue? I mean, if COVID-19 continues to cause a problem, I think okay. I think the proportion of how we're funding things now is not unreasonable. Um, I might do. I think, as you heard, the product development might take a different strategy, or at least look at alternative strategies. Um, and I think what they, what are, what are the people I've talked to thought would be best would be instead of bringing in companies to relocate. Um, but to focus on companies that started in, in our own universities, because those are the people that likely have the most loyal to the, to the state and are likely to stay here to develop the company. But who knows? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, as I mentioned, but I, I think a different strategy should be looked at for the product development. Okay, so it's, I mean, everything is a trade off because you, you favor national companies, you're going to lose experience. Yeah. Right. You bring, you relocate. You've got experience coming in, but yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for clearing that out. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Unless there's anyone else, Dr. Osborne will now present the advisory committee on clinical trials and the report. Dr. Osborne, please continue. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. This is the membership of this committee, shown here. Uh, most of these people are experts in clinical drug development or clinical trial research. I'm the chair, Ruben Mesa from San Antonio, Carlos Artega from Southwestern, Stephen Eck represents industry, Gail Eckert from uh, the Livestrong Cancer Institute at Dell Medical School, David Hong at MD Anderson, Pat Reynolds at uh, Texas Tech, Ray Tebel, advisor from Array of Biologics, and Ronan Kelly, a new member from Baylor Scott and White in the Salmon's Cancer Center. Next slide. We've had two meetings on January of last year, where we discussed some new specific proposals to recommend, and then in March of this year, to discuss the impact of COVID-19, review the two RFAs, Early Clinical Investigator and Clinical Trials Network Awards, that we um, came up with at our prior meeting. Next slide. So just to review uh, a little bit about this, targeted therapy for cancer, which is sort of the um, the theme of the day. There's no, no companies anymore developing standard chemotherapy for cancer in the way that we used to do it. Cancer now is recognized to be caused by mutations in normal genes that alter their function in the cell. 
many genes, if broken or mutated, can cause cancer. And oftentimes, a cancer requires many broken genes to become a full cancer. The particular set of mutations in a person's tumor drives that cancer to grow and spread. Blocking the function of these mutant genes is a new treatment strategy that's been shown to work very well in certain, in certain tumors. Determine which genes or pathways are malfunctioning, and then pick a specific drug to block that pathway is the name of the game today. And this is going to require many new drugs that target the function of many mutant genes. Next slide. So what are the problems implementing this type of precision cancer medicine? Well, there are many potential mutations that, driving the, that are driving the cancer, and they require many new drugs. The other thing to point out is that a mutation, we're no longer thinking about cancers necessarily in the, the site of origin, so breast cancer or colon cancer. We're thinking about in terms of what mutation is causing it and causing it to grow. So there are hundreds of new drugs in the pipeline to target these various mutations. Only 5% of all cancer patients in this country go on clinical trials, which is unfortunate. Thus, there's not enough patients to rapidly evaluate exciting new drugs. And the access to clinical trials is limited to academic centers in large, and large metropolitan areas. There's a lack of access by patients in rural or, excuse me for a second, let me turn that off. There's a lack of access by patients in rural or more underserved areas. There's also a lack of oncologists trained in clinical trials and not enough patients, so not, and not enough doctors. So we got a problem to investigate all these different drugs. Next slide. So to inc increase the number of physicians was the first RFA that we uh, put together. And this actually went out, and I think these will be decided upon or they'll be um, judged on in the coming in the summer. But we wanted to increase the number of physicians interested in clinical investigation, and the number is declining right now. Hospitals are requiring doctors to see more and more patients. The so-called work RVUs, relative value unit, it's a bad word in, in medicine today. It just means you got to do more work for the same amount or less money, and you don't have time for your research or for education. Oncologists then are attracted to community practice where they have higher salaries and they don't need to, to worry about clinical trials or educational activities. They can focus on, on their practice. New oncologists lack the opportunity, the interest in, or proper training for clinical research. Remember, a PhD researcher learning about basic science research, laboratory research, may have to take five or six years extra training to learn about that. Oncologists have one year of of internal, one or two years of internal medicine training, and then they have maybe three years of oncology training. But that's to learn how to take care of the patients, not to do the research. The shortage will impair clinical trial and translational patient-oriented research in the future. Next slide. So the potential solutions that our committee came up with, this is one of them, the Secret Clinical Investigator Award. <coughs> Provides training to oncologists early in their career to do clinical research, sometime during the first four years. Provides partial salary support to provide time for career development and to begin a clinical research career. So limit the clinical time to 50% FTE rather than 100% FTE. Support early career clinical researchers who have made a commitment to focus on patient-oriented research. RFA was written and distributed in applications received and they will be rewarded in August of this year. <clears throat> the other uh, way we can increase the number of physicians is to have a focused recruiting effort for secret scholars interested in clinical investigation. Very few of these types of recruitment awards have been given out for clinically oriented researchers. Um, and if we had a way of, of emphasizing that component, we might be able to recruit more people who are trained or are interested in being trained in this area. Next slide. Increase patients on clinical trials. This is the other problem. So increase access for patients in outlying and or underserved areas through a competitive RFA process, early phase trials that can be completed quickly like phase two trials, Investigator-initiated trials derived from work in a Texas lab could also be done more expeditiously. 
ensure efficiency and speed, partner with industry, and provide personnel and infrastructure to smaller hospitals in the outlying area to allow them to participate in these trials. Next slide. Leverage infrastructure in the major cancer centers. So you don't need to start a whole program like was tried to, tried to be implemented back in the early stages of CPRIT. The major cancer centers already have a clinical trial support unit and core facilities to manage these kinds of things. You don't need to create another model. Create a hub and spoke network model, emphasize multi-institutional trials and collaborative studies. Next slide. So create a clinical trials network with a hub and spoke model with major research institution, a leading institution, partnering with outlying and our underserved hospitals the uh, NH. Provide resources to the lead institution to administer and coordinate the network and resources, most of the resources would go to the network hospital to create a functioning clinical trials infrastructure. Next slide. And that's shown here. Here's a lead institution and here's a series of network hospitals. The RFA that we have written right now is just for two of these So at, at the beginning. And of course, each of these network hospitals that are out in the more outlying areas or in underserved areas would also be a hospital that would serve other really small hospitals further out, closer, closer to the network hospital than they are to the lead institution, which are mostly in major cities. So if you provide funding to the network and some funding to the lead institution to manage this, now patients from these smaller hospitals and the network hospital uh, would be eligible for trials that now can only be done in the lead institution. Next slide. What are the resources needed for these smaller hospitals? The network hospitals would be a research pharmacy, research nurse, study and regulatory coordinators, IRB fees for a central IRB, clinical trials monitoring system to keep the data from the patients on the clinical trial, equipment for storing samples, video conferencing capability, funding for tissue biopsies for research, salary support for a physician champion to manage the trial at the network hospital, and funding for training of personnel and site visits by the lead institution to make sure the quality is still good. Next slide. Resources needed by the lead institution be fewer, but incremental costs for oversight and monitoring, a site coordinator, an administrator for communications, billing, track accrual, et cetera, travel expenses, and video conferencing. Next slide. The metrics of success would be the number of patients screened and number of patients accrued from these remote areas. Satisfactory performance on quality assurance and quality control audits, which all of us have to undergo today, even the lead institutions. Training and participation of the network hospitals with lead institution clinical trials support unit, that's what CTSU means. Ability to enroll patients with molecularly defined subsets. Remember, that's what I said. Today, we take a patient, we take their tumor, we sequence it, and then that tells you what the patient needs to get in terms of their treatment. And very frequent today, it's an experimental drug. It's not yet approved by the FDA. So the only way they can get it is to participate in a clinical trial. Referral of patients for more sophisticated study treatment to the lead institution. So that patients with really complicated problems or needing a bone marrow transplant, you're not going to do that in a small network hospital. Next slide. So the future plan would be to create an RFA for the first phase, fall and uh, intended for the fall of 2020. In phase two, consider a more statewide Texas clinical trials network where you link all these networks together. That'd be sort of a far off several year down the road uh, component. Link the lead institutions and the networks together. You could do larger and more sophisticated trials trials of agents emanating from labs in Texas and industry. And this would be through an administrative supplement to the original uh, grant award during the first phase. Next slide, I think that's it. Yes, questions? Yes, sir. Who has questions? Craig, go ahead. Then David, and then Willie. Thank you, Dee. I had to turn on my microphone. Um, and, and thank you, Dan, for the presentation. Um, 
one thing, and maybe um, I'm not aware of it, but I think one thing that would really facilitate research, and as long as I've been in it, um, is, uh, and you mentioned it on your slide, but just to emphasize it, uh, is the ability to have a central IRB, perhaps statewide for uh, cancer research. So if you're a company or an investigator and you wanna run a protocol, you don't have to go to 20 or 30 separate IRBs that wanna make 20 or 30 separate changes in a consent form that won't charge 20, each won't charge their own separate fees and will slow things down tremendously. What's the potential of having a uh, statewide central cancer IRB? Well, you may not need a statewide one. That used to be a bigger problem than it is today because now they are federal, national, central IRB. So most of our IR, most of our clinical trials now don't have to go through the Baylor IRB. They go through the central IRB. And so that could be a requirement. But I think you're right. We'd have to have a requirement of the network hospitals to use either the institutional IRB or the central IRB rather than having everybody have their own IRB. That's absolutely right. It's a big, big delaying factor. Thank you. And one question, um, uh, I've been around at this uh, almost as long as you have. Um, and, and as I heard your excellent presentation, I was wondering if you could explain to the people on the call um, why this isn't, a, what you've described isn't a, um, if you will, I, I, I don't want to use a negative word, but, but a redundant uh, cancer oncology group uh, uh, creating another SWOG or ECOG or CALGB. Uh, and, and why this w wouldn't be redundant to the federally funded uh, cancer on, uh, cooperative groups? Yeah, sure. So those are also, the, the what he's talking about is federally funded cooperative groups, Southwest Oncology Group, the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, which is now has a different name to it. There's four or five of these throughout the country. But again, they're, they're, uh, the hospitals that belong to those cooperative groups are tend to be in, in academic centers and in, and in larger cities. So, and you still, even if you're gonna have one of those, be participating in one of those, you still have to have all the requirements that I mentioned on my slide, the resources, the research pharmacy, all that sort of thing. So uh, this is not, is not provided by those large cooperative groups. And this would be an attempt to um, allow these uh, less fortunate patients out in the more distant communities to, to participate in these trials. So there's nothing that would prevent them, I suppose, from also, uh, uh, participating in some of these other trials if they had the resources to do it. But right now, they're not putting patients on any trial. Thank you. Okay, David. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osborne. I, um, again, I've mentioned um, that I am one of those community practicing oncologists and in, in an underserved area, so I'm very um, interested and in, you piqued my interest with these um, <clears throat> upcoming uh, options that could really make an impact for how we treat cancer patients. So thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions. Number one on the CPRIT Clinical Investigator Award, uh, and maybe Dr. Wilson needs to clarify this for me. This is going to be a new award uh, in the scientific awards that we give, is that right? Yes. Okay, and so you say the RFA has been distributed and applications received. Do we know how many applications that have been received up to this point? Jim, I'd have to answer that one. I don't know. We do. Um, Dr. Cummins, this RFA was um, uh, competed for this winter and reviewed recently. Um, there were uh, okay. about 10 applications and um, I think you'll be very enthusiastic about the results that you'll hear about in August. Excellent. And then my second question is uh, the RFA for the clinical trial access program. Where do we stand with that and how fast are we going to be able to get that on the road? So where we stand with that is that it is uh, all teed up, ready to go once it's um, once there's a funding stream in uh, FY21. So Dr. Osborne mentioned that there would be potentially two networks, 
funded initially, when would we anticipate those be being funded? In 2021? Um, actually, what uh, what Kent was referring to is the structure of those awards was to identify a lead institution and then in the first two years support um, two network smaller institutions to affiliate with that lead um, and then in the third and fourth year of the award to expand that to four. So um, each award has the potential of having over four years four separate uh, network uh, institutions. And the number of awards would um, depend on one funding um, uh, availability and a, the competitive review process. So there wasn't actually an uh, indication that there would be a limited number other than what um, would be limited by available funds and, and receipt of a competitive award. Okay, I just again would emphasize that geographic isolation in the state of Texas is real and as Dr. Osborne alluded to that our standard chemotherapy that we've been doing for many years is we're bridging into new targeted therapies and those of us who practice outside of major metros have the capability to identify mutations and targets but we do not always have very good options to get patients treated with these new targets and therapies. So this is so real and so important. And I just wanted to say that. Thank you. David, can I ask where, where, what institution are you in? Where are you? So I practice at Shannon Medical Center in San Angelo in West Texas. Gotcha, thank you. Will, did you have a question? I do, I two. First one, Dr. Osborne, thank you very much. It's very informative and helpful that the uh, hub and spoke network you talked about, is that model in place uh, anywhere else? And if so, secret is a, you know, an institution of limited life. I mean, it has 10 more years, but still there's a limited life. Is that model, supporting that model, the hub and spoke, does that depend on the content of government funding? Uh, good question. Good question. Um, Let's say MD Anderson or Baylor or UT Southwestern or San Antonio that have been doing this for a long time. Part of that is funded by our core grants that we get from the NCI. In fact, a good bit of it is. Part of it is funded by philanthropy, and part of it is funded by industry contracts that we have to test their new drugs. So I think it would still require some funding from uh, a government agency, uh, but but some of it would be would be at that point, maybe 10 years from now, would be uh less in the sense that it'd be they would be getting drug company money and that sort of thing so it's hard to know what would happen in the future but it's a good question because some of the institutions that i've talked to have asked that if they set up this infrastructure and then the funding goes away what happens and so it's a good thing to think about right so this, my next question is sort of following on that again in the hub and spoke the rural hospital or the hospital in the underserved part of the world how do you ensure, what's the lasting benefit to that institution? In other words, how do you ensure that that benefit, you know, suppose the funding gets tight or something like that, does that institution, the outlier, excuse me, geographic and medically underserved outlying hospital, do they have to show for it that last? Sorry, I missed, I missed the last part of your question. So what, is, what is the outlying hospital? How do you ensure that, how do you ensure that the outlying hospital for that farther on the network has something that continues over time. I mean, they're yeah. part of the clinical network, they enroll patients, but then all of a sudden something happens, the funding dries up or something else. Does that hospital have it from that, from that program? Yeah, I, th I think that by that time, they should have a lot of experience doing clinical trials and they could probably continue at their own with their own uh, resources that they've get garnered over the time and their the uh, contacts that they've made with industry, for instance, um, or they could continue to be a, an affiliated with one of the major cancer centers and get some funding from that venture. Um, so I think, um, it's a, yeah, it's a good question to ask, but I, I, think, uh, I think it would work out in the end through a variety of mechanisms. 
And the benefit to the hospital would be that they would not lose as many patients. Some patients, even though they're far away, will then go down to the Mecca, the medical center in the, in the city, which is very, very rough on them uh, to do that, but many of them will, and they, and they don't, in a small hospital out there loses that patient. That's not good. We want them to keep the patient and treat the patient out there, which is very easy then for the patient himself. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Mahendra, yes, Mahendra. Thank you very much. Dr. Osborne, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, there was a question asked whether we had a, a, a model which really what the UTAC was talking about, and that's the children's oncology group. So the children's oncology group, uh, unlike the adult population, more than 90% of our patients are treated on protocols throughout the United States. And 100% of the patients in, with pediatric cancer are treated as per protocol. The infrastructure has been set up. Why don't we just emulate what the children's oncology group has done over the last 30 years? Well, uh, let's take Texas Children's Hospital, which is part of our cancer center in Houston, as an example. They treat 80 to 90 percent of all the kids with cancer in the Houston region, and 50 percent of those in the state. So this requires those kids to come to Houston for their care. So um, it, 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 it may be a good model, but it's not a perfect model either. But kids are different, and everybody, for a long time, uh, it was well, it's still a shame, very sad to see a, ch a child with cancer and die from cancer. And the way that was set up at the beginning was that these patients should be treated on a clinical trial and the clinical trials have made a major impact on the outcome of those patients. And there's fewer of them, so they had to go, in order to complete a clinical trial, you had to engage a big network of institutions to have enough patients to answer the question. So it's a little bit different uh, environment, but it certainly has done a great job, that's for sure. And we're members of the Children's Oncology Group as well, uh, but still, a lot of patients are referred into us for treatment of these complicated childhood illnesses. The second question I have, and, and a comment from you, Dr. Osborne, is that you know you talk about having and developing a Silicon Valley of research here in Texas, and would, would do you think that's within the purview of CPRED, or rather, it's higher than CPRED? insofar as it's more of a political decision than not. Are you going back to the first presentation that I had on uh, the companies? Yes. Well, overall then, you know, from the companies to that of clinical research to that of serving underserved areas and uh, also minorities, the whole gamut, the whole spectrum. You know, obviously all of it's important. Texas is a special case, as we discussed before, in the sense that it's so big and so spread out. Uh, it's not all congregated in one place like the Northeast is, where it makes, makes medical care easier access-wise for patients. So we have a special problem here. And uh, also, it's a little bit harder to have a focused place in Texas to have all this uh, Silicon Valley, as you put it, because we have several major areas that are far apart that do a lot of research. So it's a challenge for us, and um, also it's a challenge for the underserved population. Many of the cancer centers like us, ours, we take care of, of the underserved population in Houston and Houston region. Um, but it's the outlying areas in the state that, you know, if you, have a, if you don't have insurance and you're in an outlying county, you got a problem. There's no, there's nothing you can do, there's no place to go. And that's, that, that impact, that's, beyond CPRIT. That's something that I think the state has to deal with and, and provide resources for those, those unfortunate patients to get the care that they need. So uh, we, have, we have that problem occasionally where somebody, wants, they can't come to Ben Taub or Vera's Health because they, they live outside the county. They can't come to the private hospitals and there's no hospital in their county. What do they do? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. I'd now like to uh, 
That was a most informative presentation, and I'd like to now recognize Dr. Walker Peach to introduce Dr. Mac Quitty and Dr. Lowe, who will provide the Product Development Advisory Committee's annual report. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Margo. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, two gentlemen that I've been working with for the time that I've been at CEPR, which is just over a year at this point, um, Dr. Jonathan McQuitty and Dr. David Lowe. Jonathan comes to us uh, for the last couple of years from Lightspeed Venture Partners, which is a, a West Coast-based life science venture capital firm, and they've closed upwards of uh, $2 billion uh, in funding for their, for their portfolio. At the same time, he also serves as CEO of D2G Oncology, an oncology biotech startup that was a spin of a, uh, out of Stanford University. And he's also a board director at uh, Tenio Bio, an oncology antibody platform company. So he has deep oncology uh, background. He serves on several other boards as well. He took his degrees from Oxford University and the University of Sussex and his MBA from Stanford University. And, and thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us. I'd also like to introduce Dr. David Lowe, uh, David and I uh, met uh, several years ago as he was relocating um, to uh, Texas from uh, from the from the San from the Bay Area. Um, he took his degrees from the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, he co-founded um, Aglia Biotherapeutics, and that should sound a little familiar because this is a, a formerly secret funded uh, company. He led that company to an IPO as well as into their clinical trial work. Um, which has is, is just been a fabulous story for Seaport. Um, he currently is co-founder and managing director at Allosteric Capital. He co-founded and is the executive chair at Delta Therapeutics and is a, a vice chair at, uh, at Shattuck Labs. So um, very happy to have uh, worked with both these gentlemen and the entire PDAC group over the last uh, year or so. This it will be a farewell, uh, so to speak, for the two of them as they will be rolling off as the leadership of PDAC. Um, and I want to thank both of you gentlemen very much for your service to the citizens of Texas. I know these are all volunteer roles in our advisory groups. And I uh, thank you for your support um, as, of CEPRT's mission uh, of prevention and cures. And with that, I will hand this over to uh, Jonathan and David. Thank you, Cindy. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, and I'm sorry you can't see me, but uh, the webcam capacity apparently is that threshold has been met. Anyway, I'd like to thank the Oversight Committee today uh, for the opportunity to talk to you and present the thoughts and recommendations of the Product Development Advisory Committee. I'd like to start by thanking members of the committee for their service um, and also uh, Wayne and his staff for their exemplary support of both of the committee and a product development um, more broadly. If I could have the first slide. So as you can see, uh, there has been a, a lot of, of uh, awards been made um, uh, and a lot of those awards have um, uh, gone uh, to sort of the academic research infrastructure, but 440 million have gone to support specific product development activities um, and it has created uh, new drugs and uh, jobs as a consequence of that. If we could have the next slide. This is just a sort of uh, a list um, of all the different companies that have been, whose uh, product development activities have been funded by CIPRIT. Next slide. So in terms of the portfolio mix, 80% uh, has been um, of the awards have gone to therapeutic product development, 13% devices, and 7% on diagnostics. Next slide. So these are recommendations um, that the committee felt were drawing to the attention of the oversight committee. Um, there's been a shift over the last uh, decade in terms of the treatment of cancer patients where the, uh, many of the drugs now um, sort of accelerate the activities of the immune system in attacking the cancer, uh, so-called immuno-oncology. At the same time, the reviewers on the uh, product development uh, awards um, have been you know, underweighted in this particular area. And so 
the recommendation here is to to sort of rebalance um, the focus of the committee by adding uh, reviewers who have ex ex you know more extensive experience uh, in, in, in immuno oncology. The other uh, um, criteria recommendation: a, a number of these small companies have actually um, uh, received uh, sort of venture capital funding or other kinds of awards, and currently there is nothing in the award mechanism here to provide weighting for those companies who roll up already with with private investment and i think the committee felt it was important that some weight be given to those companies um, and product development programs that that have shown support from uh, from third parties second recommendation here is to increase the number of applications um, one of the sort of themes uh, of the product development committee going back uh, during my term as chair has been the 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 sort of lack of of applications in the product development arena and so uh, you'll see a number of focus um, on how we might increase the number of applications um, and increase the number of awards made uh, in the product development area and this is one uh, you know, a series of mechanisms to do that, uh, increasing the outreach budget, um, adding a, sort of an early stage pre-seed mechanism uh, to provide really early stage uh, seed funding, pre-seed funding to allow companies to um, uh, get their act together so they might subsequently apply for larger grants. Um, increasing the interaction between uh, uh, CFRIT and the various university uh, programs out there and with the technology licensing offices. Next slide. So in terms of uh, recommendations before the, um, uh, the award is granted, um, these are a couple of uh, several specific recommendations. One is that for these um, early stage CD applications, uh, remove some of the sort of more onerous requirements in terms of diligence. Uh, these, these small companies are not really able to cope with some of the diligence. And if they already have been thought worthy of getting independent venture capital support, the feeling is that we should not uh, add additional burdens to, to them receiving awards. Um, and then the second recommendation was that there be a, a specific reviewer panel set up to review these earlier stage awards with a slightly different skill set uh, than with the later uh, awards. And then the third recommendation is with the seed review process, again, uh, to sort of streamline it, make it uh, easier for both participants and CFRIT to process those awards uh, separate from the sort of later stage, much larger awards. Next slide. These are recommendations once an award has been granted. Um, so uh, streamlining the annual reporting process. Uh, right now, that reporting process is relatively burdensome. At the same point in time, uh, you know, CIFRED is wants to ensure that it's uh, monitoring the progress. And so the idea of allowing grantees to present their progress reports via a video teleconference uh, so that there's more interaction and so that uh, the same level of richness in terms of reporting would occur, but a bit less burdensome and uh, more interactive. The second recommendation was to have um, a demo day where uh, those um, companies that have received separate awards could come and present uh, their progress on their awards uh, so in a way where they could do so in front of potential investors uh, so that there would be a day where investors could come and see quite a range of different uh, awardees. The third recommendation is that um, is to sort of track some of the metrics involved um, in this product development activity. Um, how many clinical trials are being conducted by, by separate awardees? Uh, how many patients are enrolled in those studies? Some way of measuring uh, how much support um, is going on for the product development and um, that, that CIPRIT is allocating enough resources to 
to the sort of product development activity. Um, I think there's a there's a feeling that the if one looks at a, the normal development of a cancer therapeutic, uh, a lot more money is spent in the downstream uh, clinical activities than is spent in the upstream preclinical activities, and yet um, the the amount of separate um, money uh, going out is skewed the other way. A lot more is going to to research than product development, and there's concern here that. The, the, there's an insufficient number of shots on goal, as it as if to say, um, and that we need to start tracking uh, more precisely the number of clinical trials and the number of patients being enrolled. Next slide. So uh, these are sort of um, questions which are sort of the, were discussed by the the Product Development Advisory Committee, but where. Um, uh, there was no, there were no specific recommendations. Um, you know, let me do them in reverse order. Should should CIPRA be funding public companies? Um, you know, public companies obviously have access to the public company, to the public markets for for additional funding. You know, is it within CIPRA's purview to provide funds to companies who have who are in that position? Um, at the same time, do we, do we we don't want to deny companies based in Texas from Having access to separate funding for interesting programs simply because they're public. So there's there's some f further discussion that's that's going to take place on that. Should separate become more tolerant of risk? I think one of the the questions that's come up is um, that be because of the inherent risk in early stage product development, separate has been you know perhaps quite cautious about providing uh, state funds to to this activity. And while that's understandable, um, it may be shortchanging uh, both the development of, of, of potential cancer therapies and uh, the, the cancer, the, the sort of Texas biotech ecosystem. So a, a discussion that that, um, that the Product Development Advisory Committee should felt, felt should continue. Um, and then how best should separate engage with other biotech systems uh, inside Texas? Um, are there ways that we can help make um, Texas more of a biotech mecca? Um, and so these are questions where we don't have specific recommendations, but where there was extensive discussion at the at the committee. So anyway, I think that's the the last of my slides. Happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Will, did you have a question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McQuitty. Appreciate it very much. I know you all have put in a lot of time, and I think your report is excellent. I, my question is, I think I think the number we heard earlier is 13 clinical trials that are currently running in Texas. I'm not 100% sure of that, but do we know how many patients are enrolled, and does your committee have a suggestion on how many patients would be enrolled? In other words, what is a what is a, uh, an optimistic or an aspirational or a realistic goal for a number of patients? Well, I, I, I would answer that in two sort of um, sort of 50,000 foot level responses. Uh, one is that, um, you know, uh, if you look at the success rates of, of cancer uh, therapies um, from initiation, you know, at IND through approval by the FDA, you know, it's somewhere between five and ten percent. There are a lot of, of of things that, for whatever reason, either because of efficacy or safety or other considerations, simply don't get approved and don't get used, uh, are not available for treating patients. Um, so, you know, I think the Product Development Advisory Committee is concerned that CIPRIT really doesn't have enough shots on goal right now, and it needs to dramatically increase that. That that I think is a, is a sort of unanimous perspective. And the ways to do that are obviously if one has more awards. And I think the concerns both about the award process, can it be made uh, something where you know applicants have a better chance of, of succeeding? Um, one of the data points that we, we were shown was that people who apply, uh, companies that apply a second time, uh, you know, do not have a dramatically higher success rate. And that's a sort of worrying kind of statistic. We need to do more to, to help applicants uh, become successful awardees. 
Um, we need to encourage more uh, applicants to apply. Uh, so all of our recommendations are designed to increase the number of, of uh, you know, potential applicants at the top of the funnel and to in improve the performance of them as they are reviewed and as they are subsequently awardees. So if, if, you, if your committee was king, how would you reallocate paper and funds? I mean, most of it goes to research. I think it's 60%, I'm not sure, 70% maybe. What do you all have a recommendation? <clears throat> or do you just say, think more and we don't, we don't get into the, the number of dollars that you have for well, I, I've used this analogy before, but it, it's sort of like a hi-fi system. The, there's no point in, in getting a really good term table if you don't bother to have a, a good set of speakers, okay? And I think the concern and the Product Development Advisory Committee is that um, a lot of the uh, this weighting towards research, um, you know, is based on some assumptions that we don't think are correct. You know, if you have great researchers, uh, then, you know, the, the financial community will come and build companies in, in Texas. Um, you know, it's not clear to us that, that necessarily all of the research in Texas universities is in, that, that would be appropriate to form a company is actually being used to form a company. And nor, if it is being for, used to form a company, is actually done in Texas. Okay, and so I think there's a feeling here that... Um, that, that needs to be more to develop the, the ecosystem. And the best way to do that is to have more and more companies. Um, and if you have companies, um, as, as was, you know, made a point made earlier, uh, one of the reasons why, you know, Boston and, and the Bay Area have been very successful is that there's not just two or three companies here. If you're, a, a, you know, a young, ambitious, uh, you know, industrial researcher or executive, um, the opportunities seem to be much greater in Boston or the Bay Area than they do than they are in, in Texas, uh, and and that needs to change. Question, Mr. Chairman. Oh, well. Mr. Chairman. Oh, well. uh, Craig. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for your comments. I'm going to follow up on a question that uh, Will said, but maybe uh, I'll just be a little bit more direct. That's kind of my personality. Um, Right now, as Will mentioned, maybe 20% of the funds go to product development. If, if you could make the decision, how would you allocate the money in percents? Uh, right now, it's maybe 50% uh, research, 20% 20, uh, 20 product development, something like that. Someone could correct me. But... Uh, in percents, how 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 would you, if you had the choice, uh, uh, allocate the percentage money uh, spent by Secret? So I'll answer that, Greg, in two ways. Uh, the first is if one if one looks, for example, at a large pharmaceutical company and looks at the amount of money that they put into research and the amount of money they put into, you know, clinical development, um, it certainly wouldn't be eighty percent research and twenty percent clinical development. So I think, I think it will be a lot better if it was say 50-50, okay? Now, I would say part of the problem here is that uh, Wayne and his team uh, would love to increase the amount allocated to product development, but the, you know, it is it's challenging to find you know, high quality um, awardees uh, you know, currently in Texas. That there's just not enough, okay? Um, now, you know, we have tried to sort of make it easier for applicants to apply, to coach them on how to do a better job when they do apply, and to sort of encourage CIPRA to take a little bit more risk in terms of, of, of making product development awards. I think all of those will help shift us uh, away from sort of, you know, 80, 20, or 25, you know, 75, 25, closer to sort of a 50-50 balance. Um, you know, we, we have to remember that, you know, uh, giving a patient an article in nature is not going to cure their cancer, okay? You, you actually do have to have somebody develop a therapy, test that therapy in the clinic, get it approved, and make it available to, 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 to patients. So the, the downstream activities here are, are really important. I think Wayne and his team are well aware of this. 
but we, I think directionally, it, it would be helpful to shift that percentage over time to a better balance. I totally agree. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Is that is that techno rise? Techno rise, yes, sirs uh, and, and ladies. Apologize. I just have one question, and we've talked about this a little bit before, um, Jonathan. And thank you again for your service in, in this work. And the, the question was across the universe of product development kinds of grants. You know, we've got some grants now that are directed at sort of hatching maybe from a, a research to um, an early kind of idea stage for a company and then a seed company and then all the way up to a, you know, a $20 million grant for an established company that's got a CEO, et cetera. How do you see, or can you give us just a minute or two on, like what should the ratios there be? Should we be, you know, is there a 50 seed to, to, to one large $20 million? You know, how do you see the, the ratios there that would optimize sort of the throughput of the creation um, of these companies? Great question. I would say that um, we certainly need to have more early stage uh, awards, both at the, the $25,000, $50,000 level and at the seed level. Um, and that funnel is, as, as I described, uh, thinner than it can be. Um, you know, what would be optimal? Um, I don't know if I have an answer to that question, but we certainly need a lot more. And there's no question about that. And and directionally, I think the committee feels strongly about that. Let me just see if I can rephrase it. Do you think we need more at the top of the funnel where you have those micro ones? Or do we need more at the bottom? Or, or again, just wondered, you know, which way you'll lean? I would say D, all of the above. Is that covered? Bill? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wonder, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Dr. Hernandez. Yes, good afternoon. Um, to start my clarification, are you saying that, because uh, I'm, I'm reading your pre-award and your post-award recommendations, am I to understand that you have more demand for your uh, department, or is my, am I to understand you're asking for it seems as though you're asking for a little bit more uh, uncuffing. You know, let's let's make it easier for people to apply and be interested in it. So, do is our supply and demand matching, or did I, am I misunderstanding you? I, I would say both of these things. So, um, we are trying to encourage more applicants. That's that's no question uh, part of the objective here. But once an applicant receives an award, we're trying to make the burden of them you know, uh, conforming with that award to be easier, okay? Uh, we are concerned that with, in the case of some of these small companies, um, simply um, complying with the requirements of the award may be off-putting in various ways. And so we're trying to make the process easier, both before the award is granted to allow applicants to have more applicants, to have it easier for applicants to interact with the process. And after the award is granted, to make it easier for an, uh, for a, um, an awardee, okay, to comply with the with the reporting requirements and other things that CIPRIP might legitimately wish to have. So if we make the process uh, a little easier, but at the same time, I mean, I'm sure these were these these rules were put in play before I arrived. They were done with the best of intentions to protect the state of Texas and CIPRIP as well, and make sure they uh, they got what they needed. And at the same time, you, know, you as a department get what you need. And I'm just wondering, like recommendation number one in your pre-award recommendation says, let's reduce and remove diligence evaluation. Have we thought through also not, you don't have to tell me right now, but I mean, I just don't want to, I hate regulations more like everybody else, but I certainly don't want to put us at risk by deregulating and then we find ourselves in a bigger mess. Yeah, I think that there's a feeling that the kind of protections that CIPRIT needs uh, between a $20 million award and a $50,000 award need to differ. Okay, uh, if we're if we're spending fifty thousand dollars to help a, a small company get going, we cannot put in place the same kind of of um, uh, requirements. Okay, that we do for a twenty million dollar award. Okay, and so I think there's a feeling here that we should make it a lot easier at the top of the funnel for for people to apply, for people to get awarded. The the risk associated with you know twenty five thousand dollars is relatively small. 
Um, and it's those kinds of risks that we think Cipret needs to, to make if it's gonna get the kinds of, of novel therapies that are gonna help cancer patients. Thank you. This, oh. Mr. Chairman. Dr. McQuaid, yes. Uh, may I make some closing remarks? Uh, yes, please. So uh, this is my, uh, I will be stepping down immediately after this uh, meeting from being the chair of, of the Product Development Advisory Committee. Um, it's been a, an honor to, to serve uh, uh, Cipret and the staff and uh, the citizens of Texas. Um, I would like to say that, uh, that this is a, a noble mission. Uh, um, you know, I, occasionally I meet people who feel that in a few years time, we'll turn a corner and there will be a, a, a magic cure for all cancers. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that no such cure will be found. I, I think we are fighting a, a decades long fight, a war, where you know we will win it uh, town by town and street by street and i i think it's the determination of separate to to be involved in this battle i think is an important one and i think it's also important because not only for the the cancer patients in texas and other states who would benefit but also to help build another biotech ecosystem uh the south coast as one previous speaker called it and i think that the kinds of jobs you have in biotechnology companies, uh, high quality jobs that allow um, uh, employees to support their families and communities and um, whose taxes and the royalties on the products might one day benefit the coffers of the state of Texas. So I think this is a, a, a worthy and laudable cause and I am delighted to have been part of it. Thank you, Dr. McQuitty. Uh, we appreciate your uh, involvement and, and leadership very much. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Roberts has anything to say or not. Uh, if he, Wayne, do you need to? Do you have anything to say? Yeah, and if he does, make it real quick. Um, I just want to respond to Dr. Hernandez. Um, Dr. Hernandez, uh, we have had uh, considerable reviews of the number of reporting requirements uh, that these companies have to, to uh, provide. Uh, all of them are, uh, the genesis is either state law or an audit report that, that got uh, done on us uh, in 2013. Uh, the best opportunity to uh, review uh, those reporting requirements, and I would agree with you that they can be simplified, uh, but the best opportunity will be uh, in fiscal year 2022, right before we undergo our sunset review, uh, where we can make suggestions to the legislature to perhaps ease or lighten some of those those burdens. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, we're we're going to take a, a five-minute break before the next presentation. Do not turn off your uh, uh, web, uh, whatever we call this thing, the, the GoToWebinar uh, system, but you can mute your mic and you can get off the camera. So then we'll, we'll all be the same as Rice, okay? <laughs> Techno Margo there. Five, five, uh, five minutes, okay? Let's click on Bill Day. Jid, would you please introduce Dr. Shokar, who will provide the Prevention Advisory Committee's annual report. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kiran Shokar. She's the current chair of the Prevention Advisory Committee and a true advocate for CPRIT's prevention program and delivering services to Texas this underserved population. She is a professor in the family and community medicine and the molecular and translational medicine department, the interim associate dean of, for clinical research, vice chair for research in the department of family and community medicine, and director of cancer prevention and control in the Center of Excellence for Cancer at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso. In addition, 
Dr. Shokar is the program director of multiple secret prevention awards. Her current project serves a huge geographic area of West Texas, um, 70 counties, and address breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening. Her presentation may be found on page 11-4. And I will now turn the meeting over to Dr. Shokar. Thank you, Ramona. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to serve on this committee. I'm very excited to be doing so and um, have been engaged with CPRIT over the last 10 years um, through the programs that we have had funded. So this is a new kid on the block committee, actually. We were just convened in around March and had our first meeting in the middle of March just before uh, the COVID hit the fan. Um, so we managed to meet. We haven't had any in-person meetings, but we managed to meet by teleconference and um, communicated by email. So the, I'd just like to, next slide, Ramona, I'd just like to um, go over the other members of the committee. So um, you'll see on the second slide that um, I'm serving as chair. The, there are seven committee members in total and from all across Texas. So. I represent West Texas. Uh, Dr. Argenbright is at UT Southwestern. Roxana Cruz is a director of medical and clinical affairs at the Texas Association of Community Health Centers. Uh, Dr. Lakey is at Texas A&M. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Uh, Pignone is uh, chair of internal medicine at Dell Med. Kenneth Ramos is at Texas A&M. And um, Sanceria Tillis um, is a senior director of state and primary care systems for the American Cancer Society. Um, next slide, please. So um, when we convened, uh, we went through a process of um, how we were going to um, approach this question. So because we're so new, our primary um, efforts were really towards uh, thinking about the next 10 years for secret prevention programming. So most of our recommendations and uh, kind of insights and discussions were all related to that. Um, so the first thing we did was to, uh, do a data review from information we received from Ramona. Thank you so much, Ramona, for providing that. So some of this has been presented already. So just briefly, I'm going to go over some of the things that we learned about the prevention programming over the last 10 years. So as we've seen, the, the prevention side received $260 million, um, in funding. There are currently 65 programs active, and, and a total of 236 have been funded since uh, the inception of this. And every single county in Texas has been served through this prevention programming. We're, it's through this uh, funding, 1.3 million screenings have been provided. 20,000 precursors have been detected, 4,000 cancers, and um, 264,000 HPV vaccinations have been given. And um, so it's a very significant impact. I'm really honored to have been a recipient of this kind of funding because it brings a lot of satisfaction because the impact that you have is immediate. Um, unlike some of the other programs where there's ramp up time and we're hoping that there'll be successes in the future, this is very different. Um, uh, patients immediately benefit from this funding. And so it's very important that this funding continue. And we as a committee felt it was very important to look uh, critically at what's happened so far and how we can improve upon it to reach more people uh, throughout Texas. Um, so we went through a process, uh, next slide, uh, of um, generating ideas for how the members felt that, uh, members of the committee felt that we could improve um, even further upon um, the achievements so far. And uh, so we, we generated ideas, uh, we had a lot of ideas, we condensed them down into seven recommendations, which I'll present shortly. And we also prioritized them uh, through a ranking exercise. So the order in which they occur are the order in which they were considered to be most important to least important. Um, so one of the things, as we considered the data and generated discussion that we really wanted more information about was to really have a more detailed understanding of the impact. We know the services that were provided, 
We know they were provided in every single county, but we really don't know what kind of um, impact it has had in terms of incidents, mortality, um, economic outcomes um, on the population. Um, we also don't know what proportion of the eligible population we've really reached. We don't know if it's um, you know, a, a small rock in a very big sea or a larger rock in a small pond. So we really want to try and get at that information to see um, you know, what is the eligible population and what percentage of it are we really targeting. Um, another area that we as a committee really felt that something that we need to think about going forward is to be able to engage a wider range of grantees. According to the data, about 94% of these prevention program grants have gone to academic institutions uh, and not to other types of organizations. So that's something that we really feel that we need to try to address with these recommendations. Um, so we recognize and acknowledge that um, the prevention program only receives 10% of the overall budget. Um, but it's, very, it's a very important 10% because there are no other granting agencies at the federal level um, and other levels that provide um, funding to deliver services. Whereas uh, for the research component of what we do, there are multiple places where this funding can be achieved. So this is a very special role that CFRET has, and we appreciate it, and obviously the state appreciates it because CFRET is continuing for another 10 years. So some general principles. Um, we strongly believe that we should try to get greater involvement of regional and locally based organizations outside of the academic sphere. Uh, we need to think about sustainability after 10 years, and we need to be smart about how we try to attain that. Um, and the, the other part is that you know the prevention programming really targets the uh, disparity populations, the uninsured, the socioeconomically, um, challenged um, and people that live in areas of the state that are very rural and are underserved as well. So we want to maintain that focus because we think it's very important. And given what's happening right now with the effects of the coronavirus, you know, the numbers of people that are going to uh, be eligible for these kinds of services is going to skyrocket. Um, so that's something else, you know, as we were thinking about this, that's played out as well. So it just underlines the importance of this uh, programming. Next slide. Okay, so uh, before we go into the really substantial um, recommendations um, that will require a longer term uh, time to really tease out and implement, uh, we came up with some really quick fixes that we thought uh, could be done, and sounds like one of them's already been done. And that is, firstly, to extend the duration and amount of funding for continuation grants that are in good standing, um, so that uninterrupted implementation can go on. Sometimes, um, when, even in established programs that are doing really well, if there's a uh, delay in funding or a six month, um, uh, six month uh, gap in funding, you lose a lot of the infrastructure and expertise that you've built up because you have to let people go. So this really gets at that. The other part that I think we need to think about, which perhaps is not a short term consideration, but a medium term consideration, is how we can better and more seamlessly integrate the prevention program delivery with research um, so that you know, we're able to do more robust evaluations using research designs without having to apply for grant um, uh, funding for the research component with a completely different mechanism with a completely different set of reviewers. We, uh, the committee felt that a lot of the folks that are reviewers on the prevention program committee um, slate have the expertise to be able to evaluate research, and maybe there's a way to integrate the two mechanisms somehow. The final point is uh, the importance um, we really felt should be continued and maybe um, developed further of coalition building with local service providers, health departments, and community organizations, which are also very well prepared to provide these kinds of services that may not have the wherewithal to be successful in grant applications. 
So many of the prevention program grants already build in these uh, coalitions, but we really want to uh, try to encourage them to be more substantive in terms of not, uh, in terms of funneling, being able to funnel funds to them as well. Um, so now I come to the section on the recommendations. So next slide, please. So as I said, these were ranked in order of priority. So there were seven, so I'm just gonna go briefly through them. So the first um, thing that really resonated with us uh, in terms of uh, a consideration that should be put together is um, this concept of a regional cancer prevention hub or center. The idea is that the, each region, however many we decide across the state, has an established center that is able to provide uh, programming expertise across a range of cancers. So not just one or two, but as many of them as possible. And that they're able to support their region in um, the providers in their region in implementing these uh, services. So they would have the programmatic expertise about how to do it, what the evidence-based practices are, and also be able to provide the materials and technical support for local organizations that can deliver services um, at the kind of cold face of where the people are. Um, and in addition to the technical support which they would provide to implement and adapt the programs that they have on, um, that they've determined to be a good fit for the population, they would also provide um, expertise in evaluation, which is something that you know, uh, clinical providers don't necessarily think about or have knowledge of, um, but that would provide useful information um, as we think about the future as well. In addition, um, a way of funneling funds to small organizations, either through seed grants or contracts or subcontracts, so that um, it allays the need for an administrative burden on the small organization or clinic or health department. Uh, which is required in terms of reporting. So the, the center or hub would take on the administrative burden and the financial and reporting burden, um, which I think is one of the things that small organizations and uh, non-academic center-based organizations especially struggle with because they don't have the infrastructure to do that. Um, so th this really addresses the challenge of getting um, locally based providers that see patients that are eligible for these kinds of services um, more engaged in the secret funding. And it's, it kind of dovetails with the next point that's going to be um, made as an area that we think should be emphasized going forward uh, over the next 10 years, which is um, using a hub and a spoke model, um, having these regional centers, but also maybe further on down the line, integrating them and networking them so they could be shared practices and shared expertise um, across these centers. So you really have a statewide footprint that's more coordinated. So um, there are a number of ideas and a number of ways this can happen. Obviously, there's a lot of activity going on across the state already in this area. Um, at through state agencies, but also through other professional organizations and statewide organizations that we could partner with to identify resources and um, identify gaps that perhaps uh, this entity could help to address. Um, so as a lot of collaboration, coordination, and thoughtful planning is needed in putting these kinds of things together. So some ideas that would be really amenable to something like this is, for instance, an example, um, is having a common centralized lab for analyzing the fecal immunochemical tests that are used, that these are the stool blood tests that are analyzed for colorectal cancer screening. Considering having a centralized contracting process, because one of the challenges when you're working in um, many different counties with many different providers is that you have to contract for services. And there are many different um, entities in the care pathway. Because when you're putting a prevention program grant together, you're not just thinking about the screening services, but you're thinking about the diagnostic services and then the treatment services as well. So having um, 
to do multiple contracts with multiple entities is really, really frustrating and very challenging and extremely time consuming. So if there could be some centralized help or resources with trying to get that done, I think that would help. Some other examples are having health advisors, maybe having a centralized, uniform, standardized training process, um, you know, there already is a community health worker training program uh, through the Department of State Health Services, but expanding that to um, uh, so that the, the community health workers are available in all communities, because currently they're not. And um, they have a very important role in engaging uh, people in communities, especially disparity communities, um, into the screening process and the diagnostic testing process. Another um, area that could be right for a more centralized infrastructure is navigation, which is linking um, individuals to the care that they need. Now, this may not be, the, there are challenges in rural areas and urban areas in getting people the treatment that they need. Um, but the challenges in rural areas are very different. And there's a lot of difficulty in finding uh, providers that are in the community, for instance, there's a community that one of the programs I am working with where the women don't have access to mammography providers, um, the nearest one being 200 to 250 miles away from them. So there are other strategies for trying to um, address that regional mobile mammography vans, perhaps uh, curated centrally. Um, and then on the clinical side, many of these patients that, we, that are eligible for our programs are being taken care of by rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers. And they really need help with um, their electronic health record, which is a great tool for identifying and reaching eligible people that don't come into the clinic. Um, so that's another area that if there was some centralized expertise, working with the community health center organization that could really help. And that could also help to generate a statewide screening registry where we have a, a centralized place where you know, people that have either received services or are eligible for services are there and they could be, they could be some active outreach and connection to local hubs that could provide services for them. Um, and then the final point is there's, um, you know, I mentioned the rural areas, uh, which there are a lot of all throughout our state, but especially in West Texas, um, you know, that it's really troublesome finding providers that e can even provide these services, even if they're funded, you know, there aren't enough endoscopy providers, there aren't enough um, clinicians uh, in oncology that are able to take care of patients. And then there's the additional um, kind of elephant in the room of we are screening uninsured people, so how do they get access to treatment? And this is a big headache for prevention program grantees about how you get people to treatment. And I know that's beyond the remit of CPRIT, but you know, we are a state with the highest level of uninsured in the country, and we really need to have a pathway for these folks. So next slide. So one of the strategies to try and um, be more nimble in getting services to the organizations that need them is to have a streamlined process for application that's not the typical grant process. And this would allow small organizations, clinics, public health departments, uh, or federally qualified health centers to um, have a streamlined application and access to materials that are ready to go across all the uh, preventable cancers. And um, so this will obviously require coordination because there are breast and cervical cancer services that are provided through Health and Human Services um, to make sure that we're not duplicating services, but we are creating um, uh, ready to go programs in other areas such as colorectal cancer screen screening or hep C for liver cancer screening, etc. Um, so this um, grant or mechanism would provide smaller amounts of funds for fixed services and a little bit of administration cost and with the appropriate reporting requirement. But it would be really enable us to engage with um, a whole array of providers that are currently not involved in receiving funds from CPRIT. 
Um, so the next next slide, the next um, kind of re the next recommendation is related to um, getting more detailed information about the impact that the secret prevention program is having. Um, because to demonstrate its benefit, but also to help guide uh, prevention programming in the future. So some examples of the kinds of things we're talking about is, um, you know, what is the specific effect that um, has, uh, what has been the specific effect that the pro secret prevention programs have had on cancer incidence, mortality, um, cost of care, et cetera. And uh, we, have, we have figures in general across the whole population for trends in these over time, but to really try and tease out what impact the prevention programming had, especially on um, disparities, because most of the grants are targeting geographic um, areas that are underserved or socioeconomic or racial ethnic disparities. So it would be really good if we could have a way maybe through a mechanism or some other uh, funding mechanism or some other way of really teasing out that information and looking at it uh, thoughtfully and in detail. And to go along with that, I think another thing that would really help in prevention programming planning for the future is having a better handle on knowing exactly where and what the eligible population is for services. So looking county by county and figuring out what, what percent of the population would be eligible for services and what percent of the eligible population actually receives services. So we have a lot of data from um, the program reporting that happens and that has happened over the last 10 years. So really taking a deep dive into that and really teasing some of these things out, we think as a committee that that would be very important. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this slide relates to um, health services research and implementation research science. So as, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's a lot of research that happens, but um, you know, the data shows that it can take 15 to 20 years for successful research trials to actually be implemented in practice. So that's called the science of how that happens and how we can improve that is called implementation research science. And health services research is a branch of research that looks at the delivery of care, examines what is working and what is not working, and then um, devises interventions to try and address that. So this is a, on the translational spectrum. This is at the opposite end of the basic science and discovery-based science um, that's uh, featured in the academic program side. So, but this is very important because if you're doing all this research, but it's not being implemented, then it's a whole lot of dollars down the drain. Um, so Texas um, needs a lot of capacity development in these fields. And um, so one of the ways that we could try and improve that is creating um, research training programs for implementation science researchers and health services research uh, as well. Um, through a, a training program RFA, and then also maybe having a targeted research RFA for research in those fields to try and um, prompt more research in that area. And going along with that RFA, the review, the review panel should be specific to people with training and background in those fields. Um, again, I think that expertise is probably there on the prevention review panel um, roster. Um, so, but just being a little bit more thoughtful about how those applications are reviewed and trying to um, really get this off the ground in Texas. We, I think in general, we do very well on the basic science side, but less, there are less researchers with expertise in these skills that are very important in getting findings into care. Uh, next slide. So another thing we discussed a lot are statewide initiatives. So, um, so this was ranked six out of seven. Um, so what this would be is having a set aside funding for a certain cancer in a particular year or, or review cycle. Uh, for instance, HPV vaccination or colorectal cancer 
And I think this has been done very successfully on the liver cancer side with the collaborative action uh, program. Um, so that, that's something to consider. You know, we had a lot of discussion about the pros and cons about this, um, but it did end up in our top seven. Um, and then, you know, if a statewide initiative was to be done, it, there should, we should consider coordination across uh, state agencies and other statewide organizations as well. Um, so the last slide with the last recommendation. So um, we had a discussion uh, because, you know, the members of the panel know that as far as screening across, rates across the 50 states, for preventable cancers, unfortunately, Texas is not in the top area of that table. It's more at the other end of that table. So there's a lot of work that we still need to do despite the existence of this secret prevention program to get people screened and to get people to participate in prevention activities that can reduce their burden of cancer in the future. So I think secret has can't do this alone. Uh, the secret funding on the prevention side has gone to disparity populations, but there's a, you know, the majority of the population, about 80%, are covered to some degree by health insurance. So if we're going to get the screening rates up in the state as a whole, we cannot ignore this population either. So um, we had a lot of discussion about whether any of the funding should go to these populations, to link them to care, et cetera. But we decided that that wasn't something that we felt was important uh, for the CPRIT funding to do. However, we did feel that um, CPRIT as a convener of stakeholders that can really impact the insured population was something that could be done um, by the CPRIT leadership or a special group, I'm not sure exactly how, but so that um, these organizations can also pay attention to how they can implement some established strategies for improving prevention uptake in these populations as well. So um, that's all we have so far. Um, but we have a lot of big ideas and they need a lot of teasing through to figure out how we operationalize them and whether it's even possible to operationalize them. But we think that, um, you know, we're very, um, it's very gratifying to know that this program is here, um, the funding will continue, and although it's only 10% of the population, it has a really immediate big impact on uh, people in the community, and they're so thankful to receive these services and be guided through the treatment process, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever we can do to even maximize the impact further, uh, we need to try and get done um, in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shokar. Goes without saying, I'm a big fan of Dr. Shokar. Uh, are there any questions? Craig? Just one uh, quick, it's more of a point clarification. Um, I think on your one of your first slides, uh, you noted that the funding for prevention, uh, the maximum funding was 10%. I, I, Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's at least 10% of the funding. The maximum, not a minimum. Correct. Um, so it can't go over 10%, I think, is the way it's written. So 10% is the maximum funding? Kristen, you yes, can. That is. Kristen, you want to respond? Is Ramona, that is correct. Or Ramona. Yeah. That is correct. All right, thank you. It cannot go over 10%. Of funds available for grants. Okay. Sorry, I didn't understand who that question was directed to. It was clarification of the amount available for prevention grants. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Ramona. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shokar, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Wilson, will you introduce Dr. Skapak, who will present the Advisory Committee on Childhood Cancer's annual report? Yes, delighted to. Um, Dr. Steve Skapak is 
professor of pediatrics and chief of the division of pediatric chemonc at UT Southwestern and the medical director of the Gill Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders at Children's Health in Dallas. Um, in addition to his work with, C with uh, UT Southwestern, uh, Dr. Skafik is also um, a member of the executive committee and scientific council on the Children's Oncology Group, um, and as was referred to earlier, the world's largest organization devoted to uh, childhood and adolescent cancer research. I'll also mention that he's a recipient of uh, several CFERT awards, a multi-investigator award and an individual investigator research award, as well as several NIHR ones, and a uh, great appreciation to Steve and members of the Advisory Committee for Childhood Cancer, who earlier this year worked with the Carson Wesley Foundation to help sponsor a very exciting day and a half conference of Texas pediatric cancer researchers devoted uh, to sharing new research capabilities and to explore opportunities for cooperation um, among the, uh, the uh, very, uh, if you will, rich talent in Texas for pediatric cancer management and science. Um, so he's going to report on the behalf of the Advisory Committee for Childhood Cancer. Steve, thanks for being here. Sure, thank you. Um, can I have the capacity to share my screen? And given that capacity. How's that look? Perfect. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Wilson. Um, I'm privileged to uh, report on the Ad Advisory Committee for Child on Cancer on behalf of the other members of the Advisory Committee on Childhood Cancer. Um, let me. Um, so I have several things to cover. I want to uh, recap the composition and representation of the committee. I talk about the current status and certain challenges that we see for childhood cancer have some highlights and progress, uh, mostly focused on the last year, and some recommendations as we think about um, Childhood Cancer 2.0 for um, CPRIT. The uh, committee um, has had a little bit of change over the past year since I spoke to you last. Uh, we've, we continue to have representation that covers uh, most of the state of Texas. Uh, most of the members are physicians or physician scientists. Um, and we are happy to report also that we have three members of advocate groups, and Carol Bas Basso, Tim Culliver, and Annette Leslie, who round out our, uh, to make sure that we stay on target. As I mentioned, the members uh, cover the entire state of Texas, which is uh, pertinent to some of the things that have already been discussed about uh, the, um, the needs that span the entire state and uh, something I'll come back to in a, in a few minutes. Um, I think everybody on this call uh, knows, and hopefully you may remember from what I told you last year, that we've really made great progress. We in the field have made great progress for childhood cancer, such that um, we don't think of it as a, it certainly isn't a uniformly fatal disease and upwards of 70% of children with diagnosed with cancer today will be long-term survivors. Nevertheless, and even despite the, uh, the, the concerns about COVID-19, we still think it's an, important, uh, it's an important disease to continue to focus on. Excluding trauma and birth defects, it's the leading, cancer remains the leading cause of death in children from disease. Uh, with across the United States about 14,000 new cases, uh, new cases in the U.S. per year, um, and one in 300 some uh, uh, U.S. children develops cancer before age 20. And in somewhat of an ironic twist, because the sur survival rates have gotten so good, in some ways we've created another problem, if you will. Uh, one in 750 child. 20-year-olds uh, alive in the U.S. today as a survivor of childhood cancer. As we continue to make progress, uh, we ex anticipate that that number will continue to grow. Um, 
so uh, getting into so that's sort of the current status um, and some of the challenges there's a lot of advances in childhood cancer as I mentioned earlier but there are still forms of childhood cancer we can rarely uh, rarely cure the disease. What's shown are three examples of what things look like in 1960 and what they look like in 2000. Um, AML, high-risk neuroblastoma, the most common solid tumor in children, and brainstem glioma, a, a, a dreadful and hard to treat um, a brain tumor that's common in children. Uh, for myeloid leukemia, we've made great progress in 40 years. But still, uh, only uh, approximately a third of children diagnosed with AML won't be cured. Neuroblastoma, even high-risk neuroblastoma, we've made great progress, but only about 30% of those children will be cured. And brainstem glioma is one of uh, several examples where there's just been no progress. So even though we're making uh, the advances have been great, there's still more work just focusing on curing the ch childhood cancer. This graphic is a little bit complicated, but it's meant to focus on the fact our childhood cancer survivors, the number of which is growing. Um, the, uh, we hope to be able to apply precision medicine where we can more carefully match uh, the intensity of the disease, uh, the intensity of the treatment with the, with the risk of the disease and use more and more molecularly targeted therapy that Dr. Osborne mentioned earlier. Um, we also have to understand the long-term effects What's uh, shown today comes from a paper published in 2015. Um, and these are childhood uh, cancer survivors who are different ages shown along the bottom. And the green bars from 10% to about 30% are those childhood cancer survivors that have no uh, underlying medical conditions related to their childhood cancer. Um, at least two thirds of children who are, uh, are now young adults um, who are cancer childhood cancer survivors have either modestly severe or, or severe uh, uh, conditions that in some cases are life-threatening or life-ending, um, and in many, many cases, they're certainly uh, uh, life-changing. Uh, I'm not from Texas, but I'm proud to be a Texan, and I say that in all sincerity now. Um, and if we look across this great state, there's tremendous diversity um, and, and, and that's and a tremendous scale of land that we have to cover. Um, and for childhood cancer treatment today, it relies on very sophisticated diagnostics and imaging so that we can get the risk stratification correct and apply the best treatment. We need uh, across the state, we want uh, ch children in Texas to have access to the newest therapies. Uh, given that many childhood cancer survivors are uh, ch childhood cancer patients will be survivors, we want to make sure that school and psychosocial support services are available to the children and the families. Uh, if we could cure every child with cancer, that's great, but if we could prevent it, that would be even better. Um, and we need to be able to provide across the whole state, uh, sure that the cancer survivorship care is ideal. So great progress, still some um, big problems and some that have emerged because of some of our progress. Um, uh, CPRID has been really important in, in the last 10 years, um, looking at the progress that we've made. Um, 167 research projects have been funded by, ch focused on childhood cancer have been funded by CPRID. That's close to $300 million and approximately 12% of the CPRID award portfolio, which is much a much greater uh, percentage than the NIH. And so it positions Texas to be a leader in childhood cancer research. More than 350 scientific publications and 17 patents. And all of those turn into increased knowledge and a lot of those turned into uh, better care. Um, the it, independent research awards, which I think are, uh, our committee agrees are still a mainstay of the funding mechanisms that we, sh we continue to endorse, tackle really important topics. Uh, identifying um, uh, the potential for molecularly targeted therapies where we can match, uh, understand about the disease driving abnormalities in a cancer and match that to treatments. We want to better understand how we know the treatments are working. So understanding at a, in some cases, molecular level, uh, what the response looks like. So can we know early on who's going to be a long-term disease-free survivor? Uh, understanding how cancer cells make energy and make building blocks 
in the, the emerging field of cancer metabolism. And we're fortunate in the state to have some of the world leaders of that. The immune system surveys against cancer and some uh, game-changing breakthroughs, some of which have roots in Texas, um, talk about leveraging the immune system and curing some forms of childhood cancer and adult cancers. Uh, getting back to long-term survivors, that some of the mainstays of cancer therapy for children have been medic medicines that are toxic to the heart, and those toxicities are a major cause of, of uh, life-threatening long-term outcomes. And we have great research going on in the state to tackle understanding the mechanisms for that. Looking at understanding cancer genetic susceptibilities um, and really cancer prevention and a really important uh, uh, focus of research has been on the HPV vaccine, which uh, I'll come back to later, is a, is, has, was a problem in the state of Texas and CPRID has really tackled that. Um, in the recently, in the focusing on the, in the last year or 18 months, uh, some of the uh, funded research projects tackle again tackle big problems. What's listed at the top in Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, or bone cancer, neuroblastoma, as I mentioned before, one of the more aggressive soft tissue tumors, and medulloblastoma, the the, the most common malignant brain tumor in children. Um, all of these grant awards uh, for, to in, it, scientists at UT Southwestern, UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, UT MD Anderson, and Texas Tech tackle really important fundamental elements of the biology of these really uh, 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 tough to crack diseases. I'm sorry. Um, uh, several of the recent high impact, high risk awards focus on childhood cancers. And I'll point out that these three that are focused on childhood cancers are all uh, flirting with developing brand new therapies and early phase testing. And it's successful, I'm confident uh, knowing about some of them that's, that's kind of work that could be brought forward into clinical trials here in Texas. Um, and then the core facility support awards have, uh, can, have also been in, uh, Focus, some of it have been focused on childhood cancer, and the committee uh, really feels they're important. The most recent one is a, is a new childhood cancer animal facility that is uh, uh, centered in te at Texas Tech, and it adds to a number of other uh, core resources that help provide better model systems to ch study childhood cancer. The, the, uh, the chance to bring new childhood cancer researchers to the state is 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 really powerful as the division chief uh i'm i'm plagued in my own division about trying to identify uh, uh pediatric cancer researchers that are leaders who want to leave the coasts where they seem to be tra uh, training um and secret enables us to recruit or retain some of those john powers at ut austin and dell medical school and kenneth chen at UT Southwestern represent two really terrific young scientists who are now engaged in childhood cancer research in the state. And I think, uh, and I think our committee shares the feeling that CPRID has really been a catalyst, not just an engine of discovery, but something that can put more research resources and researchers together to lead to more um, extramural funding. A great example comes from sarcoma. I highlighted several sarcoma-focused grant, grants just in the last two years, there was a multi-investigator research award focused on uh, sarcomas. Several secret scholars are focused on sarcomas, multiple independent research awards. That in part uh, uh, led to the development of really exciting not new model systems. What I'm showing on the right is, the, is a model system that was developed in part with secret funding where a, a child form of childhood cancer can be made to uh, come up in zebrafish model systems, which has amazing power in terms of understanding the genetics of the disease and then high throughput drug screening. Um, David McFadden leveraged some of this secret funding support to secure one of nine um, U54 grants focused um, on uh, a certain form of childhood cancer. So there's nine in the US, one is in Texas, and this one grant uh, uh, brought in $10 million of, of, of total research funding, new funding to the state. Dr. Wilson also mentioned the Brain Tumor Researchers Roundup. I'm proud to have Annette Leslie on, uh, on our advisory committee for childhood cancer, and she was a force to uh, create something that was really powerful, um, uh, focused on brain tumor research. And one of the things that we'd like to do in the coming uh, years that I'll build on more is build on this type of 
a way to catalyze uh, researchers that are already funded, but where we think that there are still gaps. So our committee has met uh, several times, one, uh, uh, two times uh, by telephone, one time in person um, on the heels of the brain tumor research roundup that I just mentioned, and also virtually uh, uh, several weeks ago. We've come up with, again, what we're call, calling Childhood Cancer 2.0, uh, which continues to have some things that uh, CPRIT has focused on in the past, broad-based discovery-based research, core facilities that might have a broader reach across the state, um, in fact, impactful cancer prevention and outcome studies, which was uh, alluded to um, uh, in a pr the previous talk. And something that we'd like to uh, also uh, 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 posit, which would be a Texas Collaborative Action Plan for, ch for childhood cancer. So coming back to the broad-based scientific discovery, I'd like to highlight um, that the research awards that have been funded and what we think need to continue to be funded focus on important fundamental problems, the basic biology of, of cancer that shows up in children and, and adolescents. Uh, those types of insights will help us understand how the cancers form, how we can better treat them, um, understanding how the, the immune system and its relationship to childhood cancer, as I mentioned earlier, uh, completely game-changing cell-based therapies where the lymphocytes can be leveraged to eradicate a form of childhood cancer uh, has been a, an amazing breakthrough um, and uh, there, there's ongoing things that I know of already in the state that can follow in those tracks but we need to understand the biology more experimental therapeutics uh, so that we can have a platform to take the basic biology and turn that into new therapies um, and really a, a, a maintaining a focus on clinical translational research so we can take advantage of of the biospecimens that have been collected and continue to be collected um, and so that we can better understand with human tumor samples um, how better to the understand understand the biology and how better to treat them. We think that there are opportunities uh, that have sprung, important opportunities that have sprung from multi-investigator research awards. 28 of the uh, Myra projects were focused on childhood cancer. That led to $16 million in follow-on funds outside of CPRIT. 81 publications and two patents. I highlighted one of those major follow-on funds from um, that came from NIH in the in a previous slide, uh, looking at a grant that came to David McFadden. Um, um, and new and in established uh, faculty recruitment wards are continuing to be impor important. I think Sean Morrison may have been one of the early recruits uh, for uh, for childhood cancer by CPRIT. He's a Howard Hughes investigator and was recently membered, uh, 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 brought into the National Academy of Sciences. Really one of the uh, leading cancer researchers his, and his research is largely focused on childhood cancer. Um, and, and as was mentioned earlier, nine new childhood cancer research researchers have come into the state of Texas. We think those are all important to continue. Uh, our committee was unanimous uh, in its support of the continued idea of having um, core facility support awards that are somehow focused on childhood cancers. The impact to date has been tremendous with 11 cores, $22 million follow-on funds, 33 publications, two patents. I want to highlight two uh, sets of cores that I think show the real power of, uh, power of this to bring things together. One is focused on one of the two is focused on shareable childhood cancer models with CPRIT's wisdom and some really terrific uh, 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 cancer researchers in the state. Three of these are focused on new mo models. One, the Texas Pediatric Patient Drive Xenograft Facility. A second one at Baylor called PDX AIM. And for those that don't know, patient drive xenografts are essentially avatars living models of childhood cancer that could be renewed. Um, I know through the Texas Pediatric PDX, PDX facility, about 100 new models of childhood cancer have been uh, generated in the last three years. Those can be shared and are being shared across the state, and those can be plugged into new um, early phase preclinical exper experimental studies, studies of metabolism, studies of the immune system. This really is going to be an engine for us to continue to collect this really uh, valuable resource that's renewable and shareable. Second, 
it has to do with the capacity for data storage and sharing. Sharing. This is something that the National Cancer Institute recognizes as a big problem. Dr. Wilson alluded to my role in the Children's Oncology Group. The Children's Oncology Group, the world's largest childhood cancer research organization, does not know how effectively to do this in a big way. Three a, a core facility support awards um, uh, from CPRIT focus on developing a 21st century uh, cancer data core that can uh, take uh, information out of decades of, of electronic medical record data in, in multiple institutions and put it into a, 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 res a resource that can be shared and can be used as an engine for discovery. Uh, uh, in parallel, a solid tumor comprehensive data core uh, led by Rich Gorlick at UT MD Anderson, which takes some of these rich uh, resources that we've developed in terms of patient-derived xenografts and human ch childhood tumor biopsy specimens and uh, creates a shareable platform so that the genomics data that comes from those tumors can be shared. And also Access Texas, which will takes one step further uh, similarly collecting biospecimens from across the state to understand why children get uh, leukemia and other forms of cancer and doing that in a way that the whole state can, uh, researchers in the state and elsewhere, frankly, uh, can take advantage of that. We recommend continuing having specific calls for core facility support awards uh, focused on childhood cancer. Uh, we feel the ACC feels it's important to ensure the impact extends beyond in local institutions, and we volunteered ourselves uh, to help uh, prioritize what those core facilities could look like. I know perhaps this goes against something that was mentioned earlier about not having focused uh, cores. We don't think they should all be focused, but we do think childhood cancer is a unique space, and it's something that Texas is positioned to lead, uh, lead in nationally, and having this type of core facilities can help share valuable resources given the fact that the numbers of children with cancer are so are so much smaller than adult cancers. And we invite, actually recommend inviting competitive renewal of high performing cores that continue to fill statewide needs. Uh, second, um, we think that we, we uh, recommend expanding a portfolio that we're calling cancer control research. As I mentioned, there's been a really powerful impact of the 27 HPV related grants because that's something that affects starts in childhood and young adults. As far as I could tell, there really were, have only been three grants focused on survivorship-related grants. And as I mentioned, the a big problem, uh, if you will, well, the fortunate problem to have more and more children surviving childhood cancer, uh, we need to better understand how that care is delivered. And we recommend establishing a Texas collaborative action program, similar to the one for liver cancer, but focus this broadly, if you will, on childhood cancer. Uh, we recommend leveraging the, our committee to help define what the cancer control needs are. Some of these were mentioned earlier, assuring that, that there are standards of clinical practice and outcomes across the state, uh, having a way to share statewide practice standards and, and actually share childhood cancer data. Some of that, I think we could lean on the, the data cores that Dr. Xi is developing uh, as his core a facility with secret support, but it needs to be bigger than that. Uh, we need to assure that people across the state have access to new therapies and diagnostic approaches. We, we need to assure that cancer prevention uh, can extend beyond HPV, which is important. But we, as, as we understand more and more about who is at risk for cancer starting in childhood that lays the foundation for other ways to uh, try to prevent uh, childhood cancers and also prevent the burdens uh, such as through earlier detection. And we think similarly there should be a continued uh, 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 statewide efforts to look at how survivorship care is uh, delivered across the state and also how adolescent and young adult oncology care which is sort of in between uh, sometimes a missed uh, uh, group of patients between age 15 and age, age 39 by NIH's standards. So we recommend specifically uh, developing uh, re research grant funding opportunities uh, focused on establishing a center. And part of the responsibilities of that center will really be uh, able to look at the aforementioned it concerns to see how much of those concerns they really are. It seems likely that there'll be a problem, but we as a committee feel like it, our, our efforts to impact these need to be informed by what the current status really is. Um, and if you think it's, it's also important to have 
research awards focused on this. Um, and, and carrying and keeping in mind that implementation science and outcome research is, is the type of research funding that seems like it's missing in this, this port, uh, very impressive portfolio uh, focused on childhood cancer. In a brief summary, we uh, committee again applauds Texas and te Texans for its forward thinking development of CPRID and supporting its visionary leadership for the next 10 years too. Um, the week, it's easy to point to remarkable innovations and scientific breakthroughs that have come through CPRID funding. Um, and uh, we think that developing something like a collaborative action plan while continuing the other funding mechanisms uh, will uh, a way to uh, expand the already bold vision and accomplishments uh, that CPRID has made and, and should continue to aspire to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skipek. Uh, we, Dr. Patel has left and some, some of us, including me, are going to have to get off at two o'clock uh, your time. Are there any brief questions for Dr. Skipek? Yes, Craig. Just uh, one, uh, th thank you for your presentation. And um, it's, it's good to hear that you think we're making progress in Texas and pediatric cancers. Um, just had a question on your collaborative action plan. And um, uh, do you think um, this uh, it would uh, be uh, duplicating efforts by the children's oncology group? I don't think so. I think that's a good question, but I feel like the Children's Oncology Group is uh, essentially running on a shoestring budget. And I know from conversations on the Scientific Council and the Executive Committee, uh, most of their most of their work is focused on the tr clinical trials, focused on therapeutics. Uh, very little has looked at, at long-term outcomes. Very little has looked at cancer care delivery. Uh, so it can be a backbone leaning on NIH, for example, to get R01 funding and take advantage of some infrastructure provided by across the COG. But it's not going to get to the granularity, I don't think, that that, that is needed in, in a big geographic area like the state of Texas. Thank you. Will, did you have a question? Yeah, but no, but we got stuff to do. Let's go ahead and finish what we have to do. I'll follow up later with somebody. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh In the interest of time, we're going to take up, we're going to move to do agenda items 21 and 22 so we can vote on those, and then we'll go to agenda item 18. So, uh, Heidi, recognize Heidi McConnell. What's that? Recognize Heidi McConnell. Okay, yeah. Ms. McConnell, will you please present fiscal year 2021 bond issuance resolution? Thank you, Mr. Margo and members. Um, yes, uh, so the bond resolution that you have before you is for fiscal year 2021. Um, it is for $300 million um, associated with the appropriations of $300 million. Um, I will point out that the reference, um, the explanation, and then even some of the supporting documents that um, reflect that $260.3 million um, in commercial paper notes to be issued is actually relates to prior authorizations under prior bond resolutions for our existing grant awards. Um, so uh, that's the only clarification that I would make. Are there any questions? Any questions? Members, there is a motion to approve the resolution requesting financing that CPRIT will, will submit to the Texas Public Finance Authority to issue debt on behalf of CPRIT in fiscal year 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. All right. All right. All right. Any opposed? Motion carries. Ms. McConnell, will will explain the staff's recommendation to renew the contract for grant management support services. Ms. McConnell. Thank you. Um, yes, so um, the staff recommendation is to renew um, the grant management support services contract with General Dynamics, um, originally SRA International, and that's the way the contract is uh, read for 10 point, about $10.4 million in FY 2021. 
This is the final renewal period for this grant. We will have to re-procure these services um, in 2021 to be able to have this similar services in 20, uh, FY 2022. Um, this grant, um, or I'm sorry, this um, contract um, would uh, require um, also approval from the Legislative Budget Board following your approval um, because it does exceed the million dollar threshold um, that requires their approval. Um, we will also have to transfer um, about two and a half million dollars from the grant research awards, uh, uh, award budget line item to the grant award operations budget line item to cover this contract. Okay. Are there any questions? Any questions? Is there a motion to approve the contract renewal with GDI? So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Motion carries. Now let's move to item number 18. Chair recognizes Ms. Eckel to uh, discuss the proposed administrative rule changes. Thank you, Mr. Margo. Um, we only have a final order for you today from the proposed rules that were initially presented at the February meeting. Uh, those rule amendments were from Chapter 703 and were published in the March 13th edition of the Texas Register, and we did not receive any public comment. Okay, uh, any questions from Ms. Eckel? Members, there is a motion to approve the final order adopting rule changes to the Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 703. Is there a motion? I'll move. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we'll go up, we'll take up uh, 17. Item 17. Uh, Chair recognized Mr. Gray to present the status update on internal audit activities. Um, and uh, Dr. Cummings, I'm going to defer to you if I have to leave. We'll take over. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, I will also keep it brief. Um, essentially, we were in the middle of an audit, uh, and then due to COVID and the need for uh, all the secret staff to then move to a remote work environment and provide customer service to the grantees, uh, essentially, we, had, we postponed uh, the procedures that we were in the middle of for the audit of governance. Um, so that field work is still in progress, and we also pushed back some of the other audits, the uh, disaster recovery and business continuity planning, as well as uh, the three follow-ups we moved back to the end of this month. Um, through that time period, we also uh, worked and consulted with secret management on some uh, strategies for grant compliance where auditors were not able to um, access the grantee work sites due to the pandemic. Uh, so to come up with some alternative approaches for AUB compliance. Uh, so with that, that's a, a very brief summary of our, our report. We still have provided our findings summary. And uh, with that, I can open up to any questions. If there are no, no questions, we'll move on to, let's see where our agenda is now, 24 and 25. Uh, it's my understanding there is no discussion for standing agenda items 24 and 25. We have uh, members, I'd like to take up agenda item number five again to receive public comment because there was some confusion with the comment card process. I'd like to recognize Whitney Lusitano and uh, then Gary Thompson, who both represent the Le Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I uh, would ask you all to please keep it brief. Ms. M Ms. Musitano. Not showing and being online at this time, sir. She's not showing as being online at the moment. Okay, is, uh, okay. is, is Gary Thompson on the line? Negative, sir. 
Okay, we are not taking up items 19 or 20. Their reports are in your packet. Um, is there anything else, Kristen? What about 23? Oh, oh good, yeah. Good cat. Yes. I propose that the Oversight Committee approve appointing our newest member, Ms. Barbario Payne, to the Audit Subcommittee, the Product Development Subcommittee, and the Nomination Subcommittee. Is there a motion? Move. Second. Second. All in favor? Vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, Kristen, anything else? Now there's nothing else. Uh, okay. Thank you for meeting and adjournment. Wayne, if you have nothing, we're going to take a motion to adjourn. So moved. And thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you.